Raiders don't plan to sit back and watch tonight. They can run it with Joe Campbell. And they can snuff it with the middle of their defense. They'll need to do both. The Blue Raiders braved the storm to get here from Murfreesboro, Tennessee, and tonight they have to brave another storm. The number three ranked Georgia Southern Eagles. Hello, everybody. I'm Barry Tompkins, along with former All-Pro wide receiver and an old pal, Gene Washington. And Gene, I guess you have to talk about the weather here. Both teams, sure enough, have to play on the same field, and it is a very good field, but it's very tough conditions. Barry, without a doubt, this is the best football field I've ever seen when it comes to dissipating the water. By all rights, this field should be inundated underwater. There's not a puddle to be found out there. It's the best field I've seen since my days at Stanford. That's, that's saying a lot. In Georgia Southern, you're going to see perhaps the best triple option offense in the United States. They've been running it for years. They run it very well, and run is the operable word. Barry, you know, most people, when it comes to option, they think quarterback. But in this system, it's the fullback who's the key. If the fullback runs well, has a good game, so will their offense. Joe Ross, number 36, last week he had an outstanding day, the best day of his career, 160 yards and two touchdowns. He can do it. That's not too bad. He had 157 yards last year against Middle Tennessee, but the Blue Raiders still won it. They can run the football pretty well also. But they would prefer to throw it. They would rather put the ball in the air. They'd like to throw it 30, 35 times. But with this weather, that's not likely. So they'll go to the ground. And when they go to the ground, they have a fella who can tote the pigskin, so to speak, too. There he is, Joe Campbell. He's only 5'10", 170 pounds, but he's quick. And when he gets a football, boy, talk about lightning strike. He can strike in a hurry. Well, you know, if there is any such thing as a team that is unbeatable, perhaps Georgia Southern is that here in Statesboro. They teed it up 31 times, and they've won it 30 times. But the man that beat him was Boots Donnelly. Well, you know, the home uh, winning streak that Georgia Southern has is phenomenal. But we're the only team that's ever beaten them here. Uh, they are going to lose again here sooner or later. And it uh, hopefully will be Middle Tennessee that will beat them. Uh, they do have a great streak. Uh, that's, uh, you know, it's credit to Irk and his staff. But uh, by and large, sometime it's got to come to an end. And hopefully it'll be Middle Tennessee that puts it to a stop. And Boots sincerely hopes that it will be sooner rather than later. Still about 10,000 brave souls to watch a football game on a Thursday night. ESPN's College Football Thursday, Middle Tennessee State versus Georgia Southern is brought to you by Aetna, the insurance company that gives new meaning to the word diligent. By Yokohama, one of the world's largest tire manufacturers. And by Georgia Pacific, the building products that America asks for. So amidst the rain and the wind and the awful conditions, the Blue Raiders tee it up with the Eagles when we come back. Barry Tompkins with Gene Washington, Middle Tennessee State. The Blue Raiders from Murfreesboro, Tennessee against the Georgia Southern Eagles. The Eagles, a perennial powerhouse in Division I AA. This, Gene, a very good football team. Barry, you know, the thing is, we can take a look at the uh, folks uh, also on the sideline. The, the thing that, about this game that is so amazing is that it's been raining all day. And look at that football field. I mean, it is incredible. And it's a happening here. It really is a happening. And students, of course, have only been in school for one day. So needless to say, everybody's pumped up. And I'll tell you, everybody's here. These are some brave folks. Lights for the first time. There were a thousand people that came out to watch the lights go up. I'll tell you a little bit about this field and how well it drains. There are four feet of rock and four feet of dirt beneath the sod here. And it drains beautifully. So I don't think that's going to be a problem, and I think the footing is going to be pretty good. To kick it off for Georgia Southern. Don Norton got a triple safety set up for Middle Tennessee, the deep man, Orlando Crenshaw, number four. Standing right now at about the nine-yard line. We're underway. High kick, fairly short. Crenshaw at the 15. To the 20, little gap, 25. Gets outside of the 30, 35. To the 40, out of bounds at about the 42-yard line. So the Blue Raiders have started things off in big fashion. Here's the way they will line up offensively. Phil Ironside, a lot of inexperience at quarterback. The running backs, 
Joe Campbell of Gene Washington has spoken. Wade Johnson, good blocker, and he can also carry the football. Donaldson, probably the best wide receiver, caught eight balls last week in the loss to Western Kentucky. Along the offensive line, Mitchell and Henderson, most of these players started a year ago, but still, despite the fact they have all played, there still is a lot of inexperience, a lot of underclassmen on the offensive line. Mike Gibson, perhaps the best of the lot at center, although he was a backup. Tracy Majors stayed home with an injury, and Melvin James, considered by the coaching staff to be the strongest member of anybody along the offensive line, is the tight end. And you will see them run him from a flex position. We have a problem right now with the clock, the stadium clock, and that's what this discussion is all about. They will flex majors. That means they'll line him up, not quite split him, but line him up three, four, as many as eight yards outside the tackle. Barry, you know, I will be interested to see whether they come out and throw the football. I said at the top of the show they would like to throw it. The field is in good shape. So it shouldn't be any problem for the receivers. Let's see if they can go with their original game plan and put the ball in the air. First snap out of the eye formation. They give it to Campbell, the tailback. Slips by the first man. Oh, and we got problems right away. If you sit on the middle, middle Tennessee side of the field, Georgia Southern has recovered. Bart Hughes was the man who knocked it out of the hands of Joe Campbell. So a big break for the Eagles on the first offensive snap. Very traditionally in bad weather, you want to kick to the opponent because you feel that something might happen and you get a turnover just as it did here. Now you're playing on their side of the field. This ball comes loose. I thought, Barry, like, what is the record in fumbles for one game? Is it 20, 23? 23. Okay. The field is in good shape, but obviously it's wet. So this ball is going to be up in the air a lot. They're in a good shot right here, 34, 34 yard line. Where's the quarterback? This is Ross, the fullback. That's about five down to the 31 yard line. Georgia Southern, as we mentioned, they have this option down to a fine art. Raymond Gross, the quarterback, and he's the guy that has to make decisions on every play. Ross, the man who carried the ball a moment ago, as Gene mentioned, a key wow, figure. These are what they call A-backs or slot backs. Carl Miller, Ernest Thompson. Thompson, a touchdown guy, and the two wideouts, neither of whom is very active, but both of whom have a great ability to get to the football and run with the football once they do. Ross again, not much there across the 30. Little over a yard. The offensive line for Georgia Southern, if there's a weak spot in this team, it might be this. John Wilson and George Jones will be the tackles. Brad Bernard and Sean Ganey, according to Eric Russell, his two best up front. And the center, Sammy Twiggs, plays center at 219 pounds. You don't find that very often. But he's scrappy. He better be. He better be. <laughs> You'll see the same set all night long. Third down and two. Gross checking off, and when he checks off, that only means one side or the other side. Gross keeps it this time. First out of more, 20, 15, 10, down the eight yard line. 23 yards for the quarterback, Raymond Gross, Jimmy McCamey, the saving tackle. Barry, watch out, watch out, Gross puts the ball in there. See, he's looking at that defensive man. If that man goes out and, and takes that flip man, he's gonna cut inside. It's up to the quarterback. He rides that fullback. If the man pinches down, he keeps it and goes outside. If they stay outside, he'll give it to the fullback. Eric Russell says that right now, Gross is getting to the point, as we have a problem with the clock again, so we may have a momentary timeout. No, I guess they're gonna keep the time on the field. Gross is getting to the point that he is starting to run this offense with the same kind of proficiency that Tracy Ham did. I know that's saying a mouthful down here. This time they go out of the power eye and the pitch to the tailback. That is Ernest Thompson, and Thompson gets a yard. Mike Fairbanks, first man to it. There's Ernest Russell. Russell really has become something of a legend here. As we look at the Middle Tennessee defense, they have a strange kind of alignment, especially in the terminology. They're down line to the guards, then the outside people to the tackles. Then they have two defensive ends, but the defensive ends are really safeties. Mike Fairbanks and Greg Pollard. The linebackers, only two of them, Anthony Coleman and Randy Horn, and three deep backs, the two corners, McCamey, who made that saving tackle a moment ago, and Redmond, Marty Carter, is the free safety and a key player for Middle Tennessee. He has to play well tonight. Pitch to Ross. Ross at the right side. Inside the five, close to the three-yard line. Barry, any time you put the ball in the air, whether it's a pitch out or not, as wet as it is, you can see the moisture on the guy's arms and sleep. Whenever you pitch that ball out, you run the risk of losing it. So I would think when they're down here, you know, they might want to think about handing that ball off because once you get down here, you want to come away with some points. You know, you don't want to come away empty. You know, get a field goal. 
but don't pitch that ball out too much down here because you can very easily get it and go the other way. By Eric Russell's own admission, a high-risk offense. Gross keeps, gets to the one-yard line. He'll be short. And now it's decision time. So what do you do if you're Eric Russell, Jim? Well, there are two ways to look at it. If you don't get it, you got it backed up, and you're probably going to get the ball back in good field position. You know, and if, and if you go here and if you make it, you, well, they're going <laughs> to they're going to they're going to decide by committee. So we got a timeout in the field as Eric Russell, and you can see what the conditions are. You're going to be seeing that all night. It appears that the Eagles may go for it, but we'll see. Early on, they may put the points up. We'll take a timeout. So will Eric Russell. We'll be back to Statesboro after this. ESPN's College Football Thursday, Middle Tennessee State versus Georgia Southern is brought to you by Isuzu, the first car builders of Japan. And by Sharp Electronics. From Sharp Minds come Sharp Products. Well, the Eagles have decided to put the points up, and I think that's probably a sound logic. Take the points early, especially in weather conditions that might get worse than they already are. Dallas will hit it at the nine-yard line, 19-yard effort from the left angle. He's their short kicker. David Cool is their deep kicker. In this weather, it's not automatic. Look, at you can see the rain along with the wind there. And he's kicking into the wind, although it's a short kick, but it's a tricky win, not a gimme. Oh, maybe they're trying to draw them off sides, Barry. They're not going to do it. They're going to move it back five yards again. Get a better angle. Logic. They get a better angle. Yeah, that is a tough angle when you're kicking it from the nine yard, the 19 yard angle. You know, twisting kind of wind. It's a wind that's very hard to read. And in fact, another thing, unlike most stadiums, there are no telltales here. It's really hard to tell exactly which way the wind is blowing. That'll give you an idea which way the wind is blowing. Well, one way to South, tell, one way to tell Barry, is when you open your mouth and you get a drink of water, you, you know that it's coming at you. <laughs> that's right. That's better than the Nats that they usually uh, drink down here uh, when they play their day games. Kirk Russell said that he would much rather have it be 100 degrees and full of Nats. And that is a fact down here. There's Eric. Eric's got nine walk-ons on his team, and I asked him what that means, and he said bad recruiting. <laughs> so Dallas to try it this time. Five yards further back, and it is good. So Mike Dallas has made good first effort of the afternoon, 24-yard field goal, and the Georgia Southern Eagles have gone out on top of Middle Tennessee, taking advantage of that fumble, and they lead it three to nothing. Well, the weather has played a part in this football game already. Joe Campbell on his first carry coughed it up, and three points was the result. Barry, that record for fumbles is definitely in jeopardy tonight, 21 or whatever it is. It, it is in jeopardy. Because as, when you look at the field, it looks so pretty. You don't see any puddles. You think, hey, wait a minute. You know, it's no problem. But you could, it's raining out there. That ball will be slick. And very field position becomes critical. Make the other, make the people play on their side of the field. And you, and you have to think here that Georgia, 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 you know, they have the uh, the better defense. And that's uh, Eric's specialty is defense. So, you know, I think he really has advantage in weather like this. Speaking of weather like this and speaking of jeopardy, we have a few of our own that could have been in some kind of jeopardy. There's what we mean. That was the tower that was going to have a camera on it. And in the interest of everyone concerned, we decided, no, I don't think we're going to be doing that tonight. And the happiest man in the place is the camera who was supposed to be up there. So we will try this again. Norton to kick it away. Kicking to Crenshaw. Crenshaw will be the deep man. You're looking at the two up men. Norton kicking into the teeth of this win. Short kick. Crenshaw handles it at about the 13. Oh, 20. Got a scat, but a fine tackle from behind by Tim Wilkerson. Excellent tackle trailing the play. Here's the way Georgia Southern lines up on the defensive end, and Rick Russell feels this may be his best defense ever. Charlie Waller and Patrick Parr, interchangeable parts. Outside, Steve Busolotti and Gibb Smith may be his best player, but a good one amongst many good ones. Shane Maxwell and Bart Hughes will be the outside linebackers, and here is a key player for Georgia Southern, Daryl Hendricks, and he is a good one in the middle. This time they go with split backs. Ironside the pass, has all day, airs it out, comebacker, intercepted. 
Intercepted by Hendricks, the man of whom we just spoke. Hendricks still on his feet and down at the 23-yard line. Two snaps, two turnovers. Barry, Phil, Phil Ironside should never have thrown that ball. Whether it's wet or dry, he forced it. Bad pass, and the result is that they get, a, get an interception. But they also may get a break. They may get an interference call. We'll see. There is a flag down at the 37-yard line, right about where the reception was made. And it may be interference. And it is. Tough break for Georgia Southern. Huge break for Middle Tennessee. I think the Georgia Southern defensive back is just trying to stand up and grab them. We knew that Middle Tennessee wanted to throw the curl patterns, that they thought that that's what would be open because Georgia Southern tends to play soft. I'm not sure that that's, a, uh, you know, from that angle, Barry, I, I question that call. But, you know, they're down there. We're up here. We're looking through glass that has water on it. It's awesome. As an old wide receiver, I'm sure you can appreciate it. That was a catchable ball. This time the option, and they will run this too. Ironside keeps it, and he is met immediately by Giff Smith. Gain of about two. Ironside, a guy not want to run the ball, as no. a matter of fact. Boots Donnelly said if he gains 10 yards, replay it. <laughs> the only reason they will run that option, Barry, is to get Campbell, to give him an opportunity to get outside. Because as you mentioned before, uh, Phil Ironside, number 15, is not swift of foot. Uh, he's a good passer, but uh, he, he will drop back and stay in the pocket. Down. Transfer from Tennessee, split backs again. Back to pass Ironside. Good for Tennessee. Oh! Here's it on deep. Man out in front. Donaldson can't get it. Saw somebody else open. That, that was a, I love that call. They ran the curl pattern, then they come back with the curl and go. And uh, it was a great call. I think they could have called pass interference on that play, but they didn't. Iron Receivers side. always looking for pass Of course. There's Boots Donnelly on the sideline. See, see Boots agrees with me. He says, hey, wait a minute. The guy grabbed him. He did. He did grab him. Rodney Oglesby was an All-American. Honorable mention All-American Division I AA as a freshman. Boone and Dixon will be the safeties. Two good ones. In fact, I feel like I'm being redundant when I talk about the Georgia Southern defense, but they're all pretty darn good. Ironside in trouble. Smacked down. Right on the line of scrimmage. And the Raiders will have to give it up. Steve Mussolini with help from Charlie Waller. Better that they should pump the ball away and make Georgia Southern play from their part of the field. You know, don't force it. He's already done that. Don't force it to turn it over and let them have a short field. Field position, of course, very much a part of this football game, according to Donnelly. He dodged a bullet there with the interception. Now he'll kick it away, and he has a chance to bury Georgia, Georgia Southern a little bit in their own territory. Oglesby will be the deep man. And the punter will be chucked in. Almost blocked. Line drive kick, Oglesby fair catch at about the 17-yard line. And actually, that might have been one that he had a chance to return. It was a line drive, but I think the decision was probably made before that ball ever went up to fair catch it. 11-28 remaining first period, Georgia Southern 3, Middle Tennessee nothing. The spectacle, the sights, the sound. <laughs> The fall colors are spectacular on ESPN's college football. We it. Touchdown, holy cow! Which team will be known as the Beast of the East? This key battle could decide. Pittsburgh clashes with Syracuse on College Football Saturday, live on ESPN. Well, when we went away, we said there were 11 minutes and change left in the first quarter, and we mentioned there has been a malfunction in the scoreboard, and that's been corrected now to 9.42. Eagles start at their own 17-yard line. This time, they line up in a slot formation. That's something you won't see the Eagles do very much. They put Thompson in the slot to the right side, and they give the fullback, Ross, across the 20 to about the 22. Mike Fairbanks on the stop, but again, five yards on first down, Gene, and that's something that... Middle Tennessee doesn't want to let happen. You know, Barry, that's the, what we call winning on first down. You know, and this philosophy goes back, I think Don Shula, back when the Miami Dolphins were 17 and 0, sort of popularized the idea of winning on first down. What does it mean? What it means is that when you come up in second down and four, second down and five, now the defense has to play both run and pass. They line up in a slot right again, bring a man in motion, give it to Ross this time. Not much for Ross as he gets to the 25 yard line. Two, two maybe three, three. Richard Kindly, Kinley rather on the stop. Kinley moving into a starting position for Boots Donnelly ahead of Jay Morrow in this game. And when we talk about winning on first down, 
Georgia Southern has done that, right? I mean, they've averaged like seven yards, to, I think, average on first down. It's, it's really critical for them. They, they really concentrate on getting you on first down. And like I said, because on second down, second and short or third and short, like this, third and one, perfect play action situation if it weren't for the rain. They go out of the power eye on short yardage. They give it to the oh. back, and I don't think he got it. Anthony Coleman made the stop on Ross, and Coleman stuck his nose in there right now. Help from Buckner. Well, I don't think they made it, Barry. Uh, no, no, they didn't. They sent out the punting team. Now, when you talk about punting, you talk about Middle Tennessee. Keep in mind, this is a team that blocked nine punts last year. They come after this one. Oh, well, they could have thrown the No, they didn't. Well, the reason that they didn't was the ball hit the ground. It was a bad snap from center. And there is a flag, but I'll tell you, I'm not sure the flag is for roughing. It is. And it's going to be a first down. Shows you what I know, right? <laughs> Maybe he didn't see it bounce. That's right. Okay, let's see. Oh, you're right. I don't know that the officials saw the bounce. Well, the call was offside, so I feel better. See that? I'm redeemed. Call was offside against Middle Tennessee. Nevertheless, it gives a first down to Georgia Southern. So a real break for the Eagles. They've had all the breaks so far. And again, they line up at a slot right. It's not gross on the keeper. Turns the corner, gets across the 35. And once again, first down yardage. Five yards, maybe six yards. But Brian Faulkner had a shot on that play, Barry. He had a chance to make the tackle, uh, actually, for no gain. Number 58, two-point stance, kicks it up, 58. Now, you got to make that tackle. you got to wrap. you got to make that tackle. That's his job. Didn't get the job done. You know, you don't get many shots at a quarterback like this. And when you do, you gotta, you got to make, you got to get the job done. There's three carries, 32 yards so far. He runs this option very well. Slot right once more. Thompson in the slot. It's time to give to the fullback. Breaks into the open. Up to midfield. A little short of midfield. At about the 49-yard line. And another first down for Georgia Southern. Marty Carter coming up from a safety spot to make the tackle. Very another flag down. Uh, and in the area where usually you would have offensive holding. That is exactly the call. So this one is for naught. Tennessee so far being very aggressive defensively. Middle Tennessee though, Barry, they they have to do something about stopping the run inside. Number 63, I think, is a guilty party. Let's see. Uh, well, he gets out of our picture there. But, you know, Barry, to me, if Georgia Southern is going to beat me, I'm going to make them beat me doing something that they don't do well. If I have to bring eight men to the line of scrimmage, I'm going to say, hey, folks, you're going to beat me, you're going to throw the football. You know, I would disrupt the rhythm that they have. They throw it as a surprise element. It is not really what you consider a part of their arsenal. This time, straight ahead, the fullback gets it up to the 35-yard line. Good example of it right there. Looking at a second and 15. They run the option. No nonsense. They pick up about eight yards. Ross, Joe Ross, as I said in the opening to the show, is the key to the offense. If you don't stop him, the whole triple offense, triple option, works he is the focal point he is where it starts so if he's going i mean they have everything to throw at you so middle tennessee has to take away something and they should start there seven carries 27 yards third down and five now this time it is gross on a rollout and nothing doing he's stopped for no gain by richard kinley a little bit of a different wrinkle there but what they want you to do, you know, once when they get that triple option going, they want to counter because they want you to get your flow, get your momentum going one way, and then counter. That's just a little deal to keep you, to keep you at home, to make sure you don't start to overplay uh, certain situations. So the Eagles will have to give it up. And again, a 10-man front is shown by the Blue Raiders. They rush eight. Oh! No, nah, he was acting no flag. And they didn't get any of it, but they did force a short punt. So the Blue Raiders are going to be in good shape. I think once again, the clock is misfunctioning off the 20 yard punt, so we can't tell you how much time remaining, but we'll be back. So the Blue Raiders 
take over. And Gene, we've been talking about first down and what you have to do on first down. The Eagles are doing it. Very simply said, the Blue Raiders are not so far. No, and, and again, the key, if you win on first down, that's four yards or more. That's what we call winning. And I think they're going about one yard per, per game on first down. They run the option and the pitch to Campbell, and he loses about two yards. Give Smith just not letting him get outside. A real key for Georgia Southern. They have to keep contained to the inside. When you have players, Barry, that are not only have good size but have good quickness, you're not going to make a living running laterally. You need to run at them. Here's a good shot of a player who's got good size and good quickness. 11 sacks last year. That tells you that he's very quick. You can't make a living running laterally against people who are quick on defense. Look at the numbers on Giff Smith. 12 sacks. This time one setback and a wing back. Straight back to pass. Goes Ironside. Comebacker. Intercepted. Intercepted is right. I waited to see who had the ball. Kevin Whitley was the man who came away with it for the Eagles. Three turnovers for the Blue Raiders. They are fortunate to trail by only three. To Barry, Whitley was sitting there waiting. Middle Tennessee, they thought that they were going to go to this ball game and that Georgia Southern would play soft. Watch the defensive back in the right corner of your screen. Watch him tell me if he's playing soft. He's not going to play that soft. The quarterback telegraphs his pass. He comes back. He wants to make sure. Well, we'll get it a little later. I was all hot for that one, Barry. I had it. You were on a roll, too. Ross on the right side got about two. Okay, now, Barry, watch the quarterback. Watch. He's going to telegraph. He's sitting up, sitting up. Well, we don't see the defensive back, but look where he is right there. See, he's not playing soft. That's not soft. You can't force that ball. And the other side of that, too, and one of the things that Boots Donnelly wants Ironside to do, and that is look his receiver off, and he didn't do that. He locked in on it very early. Second down, long six. Cross kills this time at the 40. Cuts outside at 40, 35 down to the 31-yard line. Jamie Redmond runs him out, gain of 14. He does run that option well, doesn't he? Well, this is very this is a good example of why this football team does not need to throw the ball very often. Watch the quarterback, he gives it to the fullback, and he's reads, reads, read. Now, now, now. See, he makes a decision, nobody there, he keeps it. If that man had come down on him, he makes the pitch. That's why it's a triple option. And this team runs it as well as any football team that I've seen in a long, long time. Five carries, 48 yards. It's a different kind of triple option, as we mentioned. Look at those numbers. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Fullback Ross this time behind good blocking up front. Got about three when there was really nothing there. So credit the offensive line with getting off the ball well. Very again, Middle Tennessee, to me, I mean, they, they need to do something to disrupt the flow that Georgia Southern has. You know, if you bring all your people up there, put them on the line of scrimmage, say, look, you're not going to run the football. Make them put it in the air. Because, I mean, this team will run up and down the field on you if you just sit back and play your regular defense. And that is an editorial statement in and of itself. As you see, the rains continue to come. You look at the field, it doesn't look that bad. Second down and six. This time, the first pass by Gross. Throws underneath, wide open for the reception. Daryl Besser, a gain of 12. They don't throw it off, but they do throw it victim. And, and when you said wide open, I mean, he was wide open because the defensive back, and, he, and it's tough to keep your footing. The defensive back slipped down, and he was all by himself. Belser, just a sophomore. Matter of fact, with the exception of Donnie Allen, all the receivers are freshmen or sophomores, and there's a perfect match between running and passing. This time, Gross keeps to the five. Close to the end zone, no signal yet. Stopped at about the one yard line. Gain of 13, first and goal. Barry, it's gonna be a long night. I think it is. I mean, you know, it, it, it's easier said than done, but you have to do something to, to slow down the run, to shut down the run. You know, see, what they're doing is they're taking, a, they're taking one man and putting him on an island. They're saying, look, you take the, you take the quarterback and the pitch man. You can't take both. To me, you have to make this football team put the ball in the air. They will run out of the power eye with Thompson, the up back. This is Thompson, dives, touchdown, Eagles. Barry, you think they are getting 
getting a little revenge because the 28 straight here that they won at home and the last team to beat them here was Middle Tennessee, Middle Tennessee right. and they beat them last year. Try for point is up and good by Dallas. And the scoreboard tells us 6-21. I have an idea that might not be right, so we're not going to take that as official. As we take another look at Thompson, his seventh touchdown of the year. He had 22 touchdowns last year. He averages a touchdown every four times he touches the ball. Because they say that ain't bad. No, that's not bad. <laughs> but you know what, Barry? Those hosses down front, the guys who are doing all that scoop blocking, uh, who deserve an awful lot of credit. And uh, Gene Upshaw said something to me once. He said, offensive linemen are like Paul Revere's horse. They do all the work and don't get any credit. <laughs> That's right. Only the jockey gets credit. And he's the jockey. As the rains continue to fall, we'll remind you, college football game day. Bob Carpenter, Vino Cook, and Lee Corso in our studios up in Bristol telling you everything you need to know. That's at 11.30 Eastern. And then a full schedule of games beginning with Rutgers and Northwestern. Wayne Larrabee will be on hand to tell you all about that one. And then Syracuse and Pittsburgh. That one, of course, for bragging rights in the East. That's at 7 o'clock. Meanwhile, in the rain of Statesboro and the wind of Statesboro, actually, the weather, Gene, hasn't degenerated anymore in the last couple of hours. It's bad, but it's no worse than it was. And as the viewers can see, the field is just, it's remarkable how this field absorbs the water. Uh, so that's not that much of a problem. Uh, the, problem <laughs> the problem is right now that offensive line of the quarterback for uh, Georgia Southern, that's the problem. At least that's a problem for Middle Tennessee. Yes, it is. 3.27 is the official time remaining in the first period. 10-0 Eagles. Pretty good kick this time, headed for Crenshaw at the 10. It's back to 15 for 20. 25 and out of bounds at about the 27. Mark Giles makes the tackle. There was a crush that ooh, there was a block. That, oh, one of the players just got crushed on a block. So Phil Ironside, in only his fourth start, comes on to see what he could do about stemming the flow here. Out of the eye formation, Campbell up back. Campbell right side for Gannon. Coming up to play the force extremely well. Mike West from an outside linebacker spot. Well played defensively. They are very quick. In fact, Mike Ely, the defensive coordinator for Georgia Southern, said, we're not big, but we are quick, and they're showing it. Well, you know, it, it's a cliche, but they have all the momentum, Barry, and, and the, the people coming up in the secondary making tackles. But Middle Tennessee must not do here is turn the ball up. They need to slow things down. They go for the eye formation again, run the option this time, and the first man through the fullback. That is Johnson. And Johnson got about six yards. Here's the way Georgia Southern did it. They did it right now. Six plays, 49 yards, took two minutes and 53 seconds. Thompson running it in from a yard out. And it was pretty. You know, Barry, this Middle Tennessee team, they have 10 starters back from last year in offense. So this is a good ball club. The quarterback is the only starter who wasn't a only player now who wasn't a starter last year. Third down, long three now for Ironside. Out of the eye formation again. Give it to the fullback, Johnson. First down at the 40-yard line. Their first first down. Give Smith on the tackle defensively for Georgia Southern. Johnson, they consider to be pound for pound their best running back. But predominantly, they are an offense that give the ball to the tailback and let the fullback block, but not this time. Well, Barry, you, the, the surge of the offensive line here is, is what they need to have happen for another series or so. They, they, they need to develop some self-confidence. They need to take a little bit of that, that hype out of the defense and move the sticks, and if they need to punt it and get the other, the other team back in full field position. Open the eye again. This time the option once more. Iron side turns it upfield and is smacked by Mike West. Two big plays on his drive by West. Well, Phil, it will be much better off putting the ball in Joe Campbell's hands, number 21. That's, that's the fellow they want to handle a football, not Phil Ironson. So if they're going to run that play, he's got to be thinking, get the ball out to Joe Campbell and get it out to him in a hurry. It's interesting that they are running the triple option, but putting the ball in the stomach of the fullback, even though they do it from a different set than Georgia Southern. In the past, they've only run a double option. Well, <laughs> why run something the team sees every day in practice? They see the triple option every day in practice, right? I mean, they do. So you're not going to fool them with that one. 
Well, Ironside came to the line of scrimmage and saw something defensively that he didn't understand, so he calls a timeout. And as you can see, the weather conditions continue to be inclement as being kind. It's lousy is what it is. Blowing rain. And Hurricane Hugo, of course, which was expected to strike the East Coast, is now moving a little bit north of us, we understand. Take a look at the defense for Georgia Southern and the school records that they have accumulated. Rushing 101 yards a game, they pass 138 yards a game. They allow 239 yards a game and only 15 points a game. That was last year. This year, if anything, they're a little bit better than that. They've only given up two touchdowns in three games. Against Florida A&M last week, Florida A&M's average starting position, field position, Barry, was at the 21-yard line. Not starting, the average field position, the 21-yard line. Yeah, they really disrupt you. I would imagine it's very difficult to play a team like Georgia Southern, particularly if you're on the defensive side of the ball. Because in this case, in, in most teams' case, actually, because there are only three teams in the country that run this kind of offense, you don't see it but once a year. It's very tough to prepare for. Well, Barry, I think you have to play it inside out. You have to stop the fullback first. That's where it all starts. You go inside out. So second down and two and in trouble and dropped way back at the 28-yard line by Daryl Hendricks. He's the quarterback on the iron side. Loss of 13. Now, Barry, Georgia Southern is not much of a blitzing team, but they come on the blitz here. Here's the middle linebacker. That's Hendricks. He's coming on the blitz. They don't like to blitz, but maybe what they saw last week, Western Kentucky blitzed Middle Tennessee and did a good job, and they beat them. So maybe they saw something in the films, and they said, hey, we're going to take a shot, and that, that was the result. They let Daryl Hendricks freelance a little bit, and he has been able to roam the field and do a lot of damage to the Middle Tennessee offense. Third and a whole bunch. Straight ahead, balls loose, fumble. I believe Georgia Southern got it. They did. Turnover number three. I said it was three a moment ago, but of course the one pass interception was called back for a penalty. Mike West was the man who recovered the fumble. Well, when, they, when you know, when a defense gets excited, they make things happen. So you add an aggressive defense with a wet field and come up they have the football on their own 30-yard line you know everything is going their way I mean, you know, it's like a fight right I mean regardless of what the other guy do the one person seems to be landing all the punches and that's what's happening for Georgia Southern I tell you if this is like a fight they might want to stop it they give to the fullback once more Ross and Ross gets about three Richard Kinley on the tackle for the Blue Raiders Ross Jr. out of Augusta. He put on 20 pounds between last year and this. And I believe this may be the end of the first quarter. I'm not sure. They're keeping the official time on the field. And it is. So we have come to the end of the first period. The scoreboard clock is still not functioning. And a look at the scoreboard shows Georgia Southern 10 and Middle Tennessee nothing. We'll be back. Gene Washington in the reign of Statesboro where the home team leads at 10 to nothing and they are doing everything right and driving once more second and eight at the 28. Fullback Ross again into the open down inside the 20 to the 15. Marty Carter on the stop. Eight of 15 and they're getting it in big chunks. And Barry you know I told you about those horses. Those, those horses that carry the Paul Revere's. Well they're doing it for this football team. Number 51, fellow you screen now. Doing a good job of blocking. This time the pitch for the first time to Thompson gets by the first man and a long way to game two. McCamey and Carter on the stop. Well, the story of the first quarter was entirely Georgia Southern. This is a book with only one chapter, and that chapter has been written by Irk Russell's Eagles of Georgia Southern. Gross, he's done exactly what he's had to do. Six carries, 61 yards, 10-yard average, not too bad. Thompson, he's carried the ball a couple of times. He's gained two yards, but as is always the case, he has scored a touchdown. Middle Tennessee unable to do anything. Minus six yards of offense. The injured player for Georgia Southern is George Jones. We'll keep you posted on his condition. Ross gets the call again inside the 10-yard line. And Gina looks like they could run that play all day. 
Well, well, Barry, you know, I was making reference to that before. You have to disrupt the team's momentum if they're doing something and doing it well. Here, we, we, they give it to the fullback. He's getting great blocking up front from the center. Number 50, Sammy uh, Twiggs. Sean Ganey, number 51. They're doing an outstanding job of blocking. So the defense, they need to do something. If it means bringing eight people to the line of scrimmage, force them to put the ball in. So they will go now with their power eye formation. Hughes in the ball game was really a linebacker, strictly in a blocking back row. They also bring Nottage in as a second tight end. Only time you'll see him run a tight end. Thompson dives to the five yard line, flag down. Left Collins made the tackle, but let's see. So he took too much time, did Raymond Gross. One of the few mistakes that Raymond Gross will make, period, let alone tonight. Trying to get an identity on the player who is down. It is Barry Benham, the injured Blue Raider. And we will have a momentary timeout. What's going on, says Boots Donnelly. Let's get it in gear. We'll be back. ESPN's College Football Thursday, Middle Tennessee State versus Georgia Southern is brought to you by Isuzu, the first car builders of Japan. By Better Homes and Gardens Real Estate Service, the better way to sell your home. And by Armor All Protective, because we're crazy about cars too. 13.46 remaining in the first half. Once more, the story as it has been throughout this game, Georgia Southern and the triple option. Raymond Gross, the quarterback, now looking at a third and six. Not always a passing down. This time, Gross keeps, turns it upfield, short of the first down, inside the 10 at the nine. Kinley, who has been very active defensively for the Blue Raiders, makes the stop. Playing simply for the field goal there, Barry. Just, uh, I think the coach said, look, just line it up. Let's get three points, get it in the middle of the field. And uh, that's what he did. Well, they put it up once today, whether they needed to or not. <laughs> Twenty-six yard effort by Dallas. Hits it pretty well and got it. So with 13 minutes left in the half, the Georgia Southern Eagles have stretched their lead to 13. It's the Eagles 13 and the Raiders nothing. 13 to nothing ball game, 13 minutes remaining in the half, a game that has been decidedly one-sided. Georgia Southern has done it all right offensively and has been opportunistic defensively, forcing three turnovers in the first 17 minutes. Norton to kick it off, but this time he'll be kicking with the win. Crenshaw stands at the goal line. Short kick this time, Crenshaw comes up, can't handle it. Goes back, picks it up at the 10, starts cross field in a whole lot of trouble. Down at the 13-yard line. Mike West, who has been all over the field on special teams and on defense for Georgia Southern, makes the stop. Here's Phil Ironside making his way onto the field. As you can see, here is what has befallen Middle Tennessee. Fumble, intercepted it. Another fumble, and that's how it has resulted on the scoreboard. And there was yet another interception that was called back for a penalty. They go out of the eye formation, Ironside the quarterback. Give it to Campbell, and there's nothing doing at the right side. Campbell got maybe two yards, and that's being generous. Kevin Whitley on the stop. Look at Kevin Whitley, sophomore from Decatur, Georgia. Most of the athletes on this Georgia Southern team, not far from, not far from Statesboro. Quick count this time, and to give again to Campbell on a little bit of delay, kind of a sprint draw that time, and about two more before Daryl Hendricks and Patrick Parr run him down. Middle Tennessee, Barry, uh, seemingly wanting to play conservative and try to get the ball out of their area. And if they're going to do that, this is an obvious passing situation coming up as we watch this replay here. Number 43 coming up, steps up, makes a good tackle. It's Daryl Hendricks, and Hendricks and West have really done a job 
for Georgia Southern. It's a passing situation, third and six. Georgia Southern just plays straight up in your face defensive football. They rarely blitz and they don't this time either. Screen pass this time for Campbell. Campbell turns it upfield, close to the first down at about the 24 yard line. I believe he got it, Taz Dixon on the stop. Conservative play, drop back, little screen play, not taking any chances. The quarterback knows that if he can't get the ball to the back on the screen, then he's just gonna throw it away. But they just need to have some positive things happen. You know, if they can go in here, Barry, you, you know, you have to start thinking about going in at halftime and being in the ball game because psychologically everything is going the way of, of Georgia Southern. They need to have some positive things happen. Get the ball back down there. Make them go the whole length of the field. Momentum, you know, it's, it's a tired phrase, but it's so important. And Momentum and field position. And the simple fact is they're not by any means out of this ball game, even though they've been outplayed on both sides of the ball so far. It's only 13 to nothing. They score a touchdown. And they're right there. Campbell slips and falls trying to cut it back. He's an excellent cutback runner. And as good as this field holds the water, it's still got to be a little problem. But that's one of the few times that we've seen a, a player slip. This field is in very good shape, considering the downpour that we've had here all day long. So Campbell comes out. Six carries, minus one yard for Campbell. They said they had, he had to touch the ball 25 times, but I think they had better results in mind when they said that. Martin is in at the tailback spot now. Ironside screen oh, pass oh, in oh. trouble. I don't know if they're going to call that a completion. They may call that I don't an think incomplete pass. I believe it's an incomplete pass, and that is what the call is. He never had control of the football. Let's take a high angle view. You'll see that the running back on this play as he, as he wants to accept the ball really never has control. Never had control of the ball, although he was aided a bit by a Georgia Southern player, sort of knocked it out of his hands. But I think the rule is that you need possession of, for the football and take one step in, in action, they call it. And then that wasn't the case there. Shane Maxwell, a man who made the defensive play. So third and long again for Middle Tennessee. And the rain has picked up a little bit here. Ironside this time throws deep. Caught by Donaldson. First down at the 35-yard line. Gain at 12. Again, that's the play that uh, Middle Tennessee wants, that curl pattern. Uh, this time, Georgia Southern is playing back. They're playing a little soft. They decide to give them this and throws the ball with a little more authority here. You know, in slow motion, it looks like a dying duck, but that was a good pass. Stepped up, threw the ball, put a little authority on it, and they come up with the reception. But he can't force it. He had it that time. But, you know, he can't come back and force that ball. If that defensive back is sitting there, throw it out of bounds. So they've converted a couple of third and longs on this drive. Maybe a confidence builder for Phil Ironside. Ironside play fake. He'll go up on first down, this time to the corner, and a one-hopper. Intended that time for Derwin Brewer. Ironside two of six for 19 yards with the one interception. Georgia Southern is a good defensive club. Watch on the top middle of your screen. He's going to stay in that little short zone there, so they don't really have much. Good job of pass coverage. Wasn't much there. In that case, I'll take that. Throw the ball where only your man can get it. If he can't get it, nobody gets it. Slot left this time. Straight back iron side. Throws for the corner. Intended for Donaldson. Underthrew that one a little bit, and I think that might have been one that got the nose of the football up in the wind. Phil, Phil will need to occasionally, Barry, just to slow down the pass rush, they're going to need to come back and run some draw plays just to try to slow down the pass rush a little bit because they can't make a living just dropping back against this defensive club. Ten, ten minutes left in the half, we are told. Once again, the stadium clock has not been accurate all night. It's been on again, off again. And for Boots Donnelly, a long and wet evening so far. Play fake. Underneath for Donaldson, it was surrounded. And that's probably the best place he could have thrown it. Once again, Ironside obviously showing a lot of inexperience there. Yeah. And Barry, on this play, you know, they went play action, but play action's not going to fool anybody here. They're looking pass all the way. We get a good shot of the coverage. Look, the safety coming in, coming in, coming in. See, there was nothing there. Nothing there. Good job of pass coverage on the part of uh, Georgia Southern. And another case of the safety reading the quarterback's eyes yeah. and him not looking the man off. So 
Coming on to do the punting now for Middle Tennessee, Chuck Daniel. And he'll be kicking to Oglesby. A 46 yard of his first effort. This one a little bit shorter into the wind and Oglesby fair catch at the 37 yard line. So Georgia Southern will have good field position once again. There is a Georgia Southern player down. And we will tell you who that is in a moment. It has been quite a history, albeit a short history, for Georgia Southern since Rick Russell came here. The winningest 1AA program in the last five years. Look at that, 55 wins. Eastern Kentucky, again, a powerhouse this year with 46 and firm of the national champions with 45 wins. Idaho, we're going to be up in Moscow, Idaho next week for that game between Idaho and Montana. But Georgia Southern under Irk Russell, nine wins more than anybody else in 1AA football in the last five years. And Barry, what Georgia Southern is doing to Middle Tennessee here, they've done all along. If you look at the way they scored, it, you know, so far this year, they've outscored their opponents in the first quarter by 31, by 31 points for Georgia Southern, three for the opposition. Go to the second quarter, they have 31, the opposition nothing. So, I mean, this is in keeping with the way they play football. Good, solid defense, and they run that triple option at you. 62 to three, that's not bad. It's 13 to nothing tonight. Eugene Hayes is the injured player. And while they look him over, we will jump off the track. 9.48 left and a half. 13-0, Eagles. Eugene Hayes, the injured player, being tended to on the bench. And we, of course, will keep you posted. Looks like an ankle injury of some sort. This does not look too positive. We will try to let you know exactly what his condition is. Back in the ballgame, as you see, George Jones, who went out with an injury. Senior tackle three-year backup now getting to playing time and he in large part accounting for the 6.2 yard rushing average so far today and no change on that play as Joe Ross gets about six. Got to have those hosses up front. Jones as we just saw number 66, number 51 Sean Ganey the center. They do an outstanding job of blocking and they do it especially against this middle Tennessee team because Barry they do a lot of slanting. A lot of easy team to block against. Now they move at the snap of the ball. You know, another thing I think is very interesting as the discussion goes on with the officials, and I don't know, if, I've never seen this before. I don't know if you have. They only have one snap count. They come to the line of scrimmage, they may as well just say hike. They're no secret. Same snap count every time they come to the line of scrimmage because their coaching staff just feels they can execute better if they know what's coming and they just get as many repetitions as they can. And they still get off the ball faster than anybody else. Well, what they want to beat you with is the triple option. Uh, their philosophy is we're not going to beat you with the snap count. We don't care if you know what that is. We want to beat you on the option. And with a quarterback like they have, uh, they outclass a lot of people. I really like Eric Russell's attitude. He says, the more simple we keep it, the easier it is for our players to understand. And that's not degrading his players. He just has that attitude. Give it to the fullback, Ross again. Ross this time for a first down and more inside the midfield stripe to the 48. Coleman and Carter, but they were late. Number 52, the left guard, Brad Bernard. Watch, watch this block. Right up there, good block, follows up. No one touches him until he's about four yards downfield. You know, the running back comes back to the huddle. He says, thanks, guys. The <laughs> yeah, men the up audit. front, the, they control that line of scrimmage. That's where it all starts. Now, here's Gross checking off. And as he mentioned, they only have one check off, and that's change the side from one side to the other, because they do the same thing every time. Gross gets 10. A little short of the first down. Marty Carter very frustrated, and it's been a frustrating night so far for the Blue Raiders. To show you how well they run that option, number 36, Joe Ross gets tackled on this play. He even fooled me. See if you can see it, number 36. Watch, they're going to come in and tackle it. Look, tackle it. Quarterback's got the ball around the corner. They do an excellent job. He puts it in, and he rides, he rides, and then pulls it out right at the last minute. Seven carries, 70 yards for Gross, and like numbers for Joe Ross. Give it to the fullback, Ross. And Ross gets it to the 35. I was wrong, incidentally, that previous play was enough for a first down. You know, Barry, what they'll do, uh-oh, that's got a, got a little problem here. Joe's limping off the field, that's Joe Ross. And again, looks like he might have turned an ankle or something. And he is in some pain. So Ross will leave. And he will be replaced by Willando Ficklin, just a freshman, a first-year freshman. Gross throws, almost intercepted. 
Mike Fairbanks got a hand on it. Ball was a little underthrown by Gross. They don't put it up that often, but he has a pretty good arm. I, I like the way he throws. He gets outside here on the rollout. And as you'll see, number 24 from Middleton C gets a hand on this ball right there. Ooh. Hit him in the wrong spot. That's right. Hit him in the wrong spot. Watch this. Watch this. Hits him in the wrong spot. No, don't hit the hands. But Almost, it's wet. It's wet. Almost nearly. Not quite hardly. Third down and 10. Gross rolls out. Oh! That's a live ball. Now, they consider that a pass because it's forward, huh? You're right. That's right. I, I apologize. I did say it was a live ball. It's not. But it looked, it, for a minute, I thought that it was a fumble, but that was a planned play. That's the old, the old shovel play. That, a lot of uh, teams using that play these days. Watch the action here. As long as that ball goes forward, that's the same as a pass. You see, if that ball falls to the ground, that's an incompleted pass. Was caught that by long field goal try on its way and very short and off to the right. Never did really get under that. That was David Cool. As we mentioned, they have a long place kicker and a short place kicker. The short place kicker is Dallas. Long place kicker is Cool, and Cool was short. But Barry, you know, it's kind of interesting on the latter part of that 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 drive. They went away from what they were doing that was successful. All of a sudden, they start passing the ball. They're rolling out. They did it on their second place, and they really didn't move the football. I, I wonder why did they go away from their game plan? Well, it was working so well. It was consistent with Ross going out of the ball game and Ficklin coming in, true freshman, at the fullback spot. And they put it up twice in a row. So Middle Tennessee takes over at the 32, still trailing only 13 to nothing. And the option with Ironside being stripped for the ball, and there's another turnover as Georgia Southern's Michael Berry has come away with it. Coming down the line, Ironside's just, actually, he just loses the ball, Berry. I don't even think it was knocked out of his hands. You know, I think what happens, though, you know, if things start to go wrong, you start thinking about things. You know, you start thinking, what's going to happen next? And invariably, it happens. You know, I, I think the football team, they're, they're, Middle Tennessee is thinking too much about what's going wrong. Ross is back at fullback now. And Gross keeps it. And for the first time, the Blue Raiders managed to contain Ross in the backfield. Randy Horn coming up from his linebacker spot. That is the first time all day they've stopped Gross. Again, Barry, I, if you know, if I'm a defensive coordinator, I'm going to make Jordan Southern put the ball in the air. I'm not going to let them beat me on the ground. You know, I will invite you to throw the football. Give this time to Ross. Ross into the open again. Gets it in. Fumble. Fumble, and let's see. Middle Tennessee says they have it. No sign yet. There yes, is. they do. So they get it back, and let's see if that doesn't light a fire under the Blue Raiders. Take another look at it. Ross was in the open, really in the open. Oh, gets his shoulder right on the football. Maybe this is the break that, uh, that Middle Tennessee needs to get the thing turned around a little bit. And once again, we will tell you the scoreboard clock is not functioning, so frankly, we have no idea how much time is left in the first half. Pitch this time to Campbell. Campbell at the left side. Got the kick out block, but again, great pursuit by the Georgia Southern defense. Daryl Hendricks having an excellent game defensively. You know, again, when you're playing against good athletes, it's tough to make a living running wide because, because they pursue so well. Number 43, look, reads, 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 inside out. Gets out there. Look at all those dark colors around the jersey. It's tough to make a living running wide. They'll just stretch it out and make you run to the sideline. I'll tell you what they've done to Campbell today. Seven carries, minus one yard. Here's the option again, the pitch to Campbell, and he did well just to control it. Got about two yards, knocked out of bounds by Oglesby and Taz Dixon. You were exactly right when you said he, he did a good job of just holding on to it. Watch the pursuit. Hendrick, inside out, inside out, forces the pitch. Now the other man should come up. Should come up, make... Uh, Hendricks having an excellent game. So is Mike West. They let Hendricks freelance a little bit. One of the things that Bruce Donnelly said was, we've got to be able to block their tackles and their middle linebacker. Well, they may be doing an adequate job on the tackles, but they're not doing anything with the middle linebacker. Come on, come on, come on. 
outside the pass. Screen for Campbell. In the middle of the screen was West. He turned Campbell inside and thus turned the play inside. Giff Smith eventually made the tackle, but the guy who turned it in was Mike West. And so Middle Tennessee will have to give it up again in the rain of Paulson Stadium in Statesboro. And once again, the Eagles were almost assured of good field position. Oglesby stands at the 47-yard line to receive Daniel's kick. Eagles show a 10-man front here. Oh, they were all over that one. A line drive takes a good hop for the Raiders. And it will be dead at the 42-yard line, so not bad field position for Georgia Southern. 36-yard punt, and he did well to get that much out of it. Well, we'll remind you that coming up at halftime, we'll give you an update on the weather. And the weather, of course, is really a big story on this sports night. Take a look at Eric Russell, one of the more interesting people. Descri described him as kind of a cross between Don Rickles, Will Rogers, and Bear Bryant. And we'll take a look at what the middle linebackers have done in this football game. And what they have done is yeoman's duty so far. Gross this time, pitch back, pitch the ball a little bit behind Thompson, and Thompson is hit for a loss of about three. Mike Fairbanks on the stop. Quarterback, watch that read. He puts the ball in there, he reads, the man comes to him, he flips it outside. Nice job of uh, handwork there. That is the first minus yardage offensive situation that Georgia Southern's had tonight. That'll tell you how well they've gone. But even so, they only lead by 13. Give it to Ross this time at the left side. And suddenly the Blue Raider defense has got a little bit tougher, Jim. But, you know, Barry, the surprising thing is that, you know, the score, 13 to nothing, it really is, in my opinion, more lopsided than that. I mean, I, I think they're fortunate that the score is only 13 to nothing. So if they can, in fact, hold them here, and go in at halftime with this score, I think that uh, Middle Tennessee would have to feel fortunate. I don't think there's any question about that. Right now, the defense is stiffening just a little bit. The third down and eight now. And once again, we mentioned that a third and long situation like this is not necessarily a passing down. Gross this time, keeps it, turns it upfield, stops short of the first down at the 48-yard line, and the Raiders will get it back. Marty Carter makes the stop. Good sequence defensively for Middle Tennessee. Well, they, they seem to be getting more into the flow. They seem to be forcing the quarterback. You play it inside out, play it inside out. Say, so when he comes up there, they're, they're, now they knew they had some room to play with on this one. They come after this one, up the middle, didn't get it. Twisting kick, headed for the sideline and out of bounds at about the 18-yard line. 33-yard punt, and they do play havoc with your punter, I'll tell you that because you think about it. You exactly. know they do a good job of it, so you're thinking about it. Where are they going to come from? Where are they going to come from? You're thinking more about that than kicking the ball, and then you shank one. Well, a show that I think really worthy of checking out this Sunday, the NFL Dream Season. I don't know if you've seen that, Gene, but it's most entertaining. This Sunday, the 1976 Oakland Raiders with John Madden, the head coach, take on the 1969 Kansas City Chiefs. That was a team that was, of course, coached by Hank Stram, quarterback by my pal Len Dawson. I don't know who I like it now. Out of the eye formation. And they give it to the tailback. And I'll tell you, Campbell has got nothing all night long. Two minutes and 45 seconds is the official time that we get remaining in the first half. Campbell got a yard. Might get him back to net zero for the night. Fumble from the snap from center, and Ironside dives on it, but in the process, burns it down. It'll be third down at about 11. Barry, the wind is really picking up here. And if Middle Tennessee wants to throw the football, it looks like they would be throwing it right into the wind. So that kind of takes that away from them. You can see the way the wind is blowing now up the top of your screen. Take a look. As you can see, the, the, the field obviously very wet. Football hard to handle. But you know, with that wind, uh, 245 left, with that wind coming right at you, it really handicaps their offense here. Oh, 
they go out of the eye formation. Draw play this time for Campbell. Campbell stutter steps across the 20 to the 21. We've got about three back, but still nine yards short of the first down, and the Blue Raiders will have to give it up. Mark Hughes and Giff Smith, and it was Ricky Martin, I beg your pardon, not Campbell, the ball carrier that time. Martin, the junior out of Lyrely, Georgia, coming on to spell Campbell, who has had a very tough night. Time out of the field, 13-0. Eagles will be back. Chuck Daniel, who has been perhaps the busiest Blue Raiders so far tonight. We'll kick it away, as you see, averaging 36 and change. And he will be kicking into the wind, and that is not an easy task. And Oglesby, who can bring it. But the Eagles have been wont to try a return. They have fair caught every Blue Raider punt. Line drive kick, and Oglesby will just let it go. I think if you touch one of the Middle Tennessee players. I believe it did, and it's going to be only a 23-yard kick. They're going to bring it back to the 45-yard line. Well, more football coming up your coming your way this weekend on ESPN. Let's take a look at this punt once more. See, they went see for it. it. They went for it. It's going to hit. It's going to hit one of the right there. Right there. Hit him in the knee. Right in the shin. And that's where they mark the ball there. Good call right at the 45-yard line. Will cost them 15 yards. That not really an error because he didn't know where the ball was coming. Out of the backfield this time, Thompson incomplete. Well, Boots Donnelly said that we got to stop him on first and second down and force him to put the ball in the air, something you feel that they have to do, and that's certainly a fact, but it is also a fact that they've not been able to stop them on first and second down, and that's been the story of the game. And, and the credit very goes to the offensive line of Georgia Southern. They, the center and the two guards, that's where it all starts, right there in the middle, and they've done a very good job of controlling the line of scrimmage. So second down and 10. Gross this time. Keeps it, cuts it back to the 40. Gets oh, the oh! 45, 30. Cuts back inside 25 to about the 22-yard line. How do you like that one? That's a beautiful run. 21 yards. Okay. He's going to see the man come inside right here and then look. Cut on a dime, leave a little change. In college football, you can go against the grain. In professional football, you don't do that. But in college football, if you go against that grain, you can get some big, big runs. Big, big runs. Because and people don't pursue as well. You touched on it earlier, too. The defense of the Blue Raiders is a slanting kind of defense. The snap of the ball, they slant one way or another, and he just got them all going that way, took it back against the grain. And he will come and talk it over with the Brain Trust. And we'll remind you once more at halftime. We'll tell you all about the weather and the weather prospects here in Statesboro. Believe it or not, Gene, are getting better. We expect the rain to actually stop sometime in the next half hour. It will still be windy, but the rain may let up, believe it or not. And we'll tell you all about a most interesting guy, Irk Russell, the head coach here. Formerly, of course, at Georgia, defensive coordinator at Georgia for 17 years. Minute and four seconds remaining in the first half. And the winningest active 1AA coach, over 80%. First year when he started the program up with nothing but walk-ons, he was seven and four. That really says something. Well, the Eagles would like to put a little bit more on the board if they can. They give it to the fullback, Ross. Steps over the first man, down about the 16. Ross is trying to get his players to hurry up. He wants to get another playoff without, without taking a timeout. And again, we tell you the clock is misfunctioning. We know there's inside of one minute to play, but we can't tell you how much. Gross this time airs it out. Oh, in and out of the hands of the intended receiver. Terrence Sorrell. Yeah, Gross is a little upset because he can't throw it much better than that. Right between the eight and the eight. And, and last week, Terrell came up with a big play, a 60-yard touchdown. Watch, he's trying to cradle it. Watch, he's going to look at him, look at him, look at him. He's trying to cradle Who? See, it's wet, goes, just skips right off there, hit him right in the chest. Yeah, that's one that you can really attribute to the weather here. 48 seconds, we get the word. 
remaining in the first half. And the clock, of course, is stopped. Third down and four. Slot right this time. As they put Allen in the slot. And straight ahead. Inside the 15 to the 14, short of the first down. It will bring about the presence of the field goal team. Well, Gross is upset here, Barry, because he thought he had a chance to get the ball into the end zone. If they catch that pass, they do. So once that happened, then they just said, okay, let's just set up for the field goal, run the ball, line it up, and we'll kick it and take three points. Mike Dow has to try it from the 21 to 31 yard effort with the wind at his back. And I don't know. Might have shanked it. No, he got it. Wasn't pretty, but it does count. And that actually is a fairly big three points because it puts him in a situation where Middle Tennessee has to score three times. It's 16 to nothing with about 40 seconds remaining in the half. Yeah. That takes you back, doesn't it? That's our producer, director. <laughs> and as you can see, there's a great spirit here. What a hurricane. We're still doing that eagle thing. And with that, the half apparently has come to an end. Either that or we're going to play it with you and I. <laughs> so the clock is malfunctioning. The half is over, and the Eagles are doing it all right. We'll be back. Okay, thanks very much, Barry and Gene. We'll get back to you for the second half. Both teams battling that common opponent of the element. Georgia Southern handling things pretty well. Just one turnover in the first half. Not bad considering they run the triple option offense. When we continue at halftime, we'll update you on the location of Hurricane Hugo, also the baseball scores, and an update on Earth Russell when we continue. Georgia Southern, 16-0 over Middle Tennessee State at halftime. Tonight's halftime report is brought to you by the Coca-Cola Company and your local Coca-Cola bottler. The rainy weather tonight in Statesboro, the early effects of Hurricane Hugo. Now, the hurricane has already caused the postponement of one game this Saturday, the Pride Bowl, a charity game in Newark, New Jersey, between Wagner and Davidson. Davidson not be able to get out of their uh, home in North Carolina tomorrow. They're not going to be able to get to New Jersey. The game was scheduled for Saturday. It'll now be played on Sunday. Now, Hugo's winds now 135 miles an hour. This is being called the worst hurricane to threaten the Georgia and South Carolina coast in this century. For an update on Hugo's latest position, we go to John Hope of the Weather Channel. There you can see the eye of the hurricane. Now, it continues to move toward the northwest at just about uh, 20 miles an hour. We haven't seen an awful lot of change in that. The Hurricane Center has been forecasting it perhaps to turn a little bit more and go toward the northwest. We haven't really seen it start to do that yet. What we see is a continuous path toward the northwest, and it's now centered just about 125 miles southeast of Charleston, South Carolina. Let's look at this action radar, too, now. And as we look at the action radar, you can certainly see the eye moving again toward the northwest at about 20 miles an hour. Now, there's a couple unfortunate things, I think, about this hurricane. Not only is it a very powerful hurricane, it's a very solid Category 4 on the Saffir-Simpson scale, but it looks very much as if it's going to come into this area of the South Carolina coast somewhere near the time of high tide. And that means that whatever storm surge is generated, and we think it might be up to 17 feet, will be added to the, what is already a high astronomical tide. So we could be seeing some tides in that area in excess of 20 feet, which is very, very high indeed. Okay, thank you very much, John. The after effects of the hurricane, of course, could affect some games on Saturday. Mississippi State, Georgia, Georgia Tech, South Carolina, and Maryland Clemson. We'll keep you posted throughout the night if there are developments in Hurricane Hugo. Okay, from the winds of Hugo to the Windy City now. The Cubs and Cards involved in a stormy race for the NL East title. Chicago's lead was down to three games. They sent ace Mike Maddox against the Phillies at Wrigley Field this afternoon. Maddox uh, going for his 18th win. Got a strong performance here. Keith Miller. Goes down swinging, one of six strikeouts for Maddox. Cubs would get all they needed in the third. Two outs, Rick Rona on first. Doug Dicenzo, the ground ball to Charlie Hayes. Rona hustling, Hayes not hustling, beats the throw. Rona goes to third, that was Dicenzo going to first. Next batter, Ryan Sandberg. Bangs the base in the left field. Rona comes around, the Cubs have a 2-0 lead. Mark Grace, the next batter. Another base hit up the middle. In comes Dicenzo, 3-0 the Chicago lead. And then Andre Dawson. Bit of an off year for him. They want him to get hot late in the season. He responds right here. 
knocks it out on the Waveland Avenue. Watch the scramble for the ball. And the mailman out muscling seven or eight kids. Not rain, nor sleet, nor slow, nor a crowd. And he comes up with the ball. The Cubs in a romp, 9-1. Maddox is 18 wins, equaling his total of last year. He allowed six hits and struck out six. The Cubs' magic number now down to seven. The Mets and Cardinals, Daryl Strawberry has a two-run single. The Mets had four runs in the third inning. They now lead St. Louis in the fifth by a score of 4 nothing. Sid Fernandez and Ted Power are pitching. The Expos have a slim chance left. They lead the Pirates 6-5 in the seventh. Mike Fitzgerald had a grand slam for Montreal in the first inning. Mike Lavalier, a three-run homer for Pittsburgh. Zane Smith and Rick Reed are pitching. In the NL West, the Padres cling to their slim hopes, although the Giants' dramatic ninth inning rally last night against the Dodgers kept San Diego five games back, every game critical for Jack McKeon's ball club. They visited the Reds this afternoon in a wild one. As we go to the highlights in Riverfront Stadium, top of the ninth, tied at seven, John Franco walks Carmelo Martinez with the bases loaded. Tony Gwynn comes in to score. Padres lead it 8-7. Later on, the Padres going for insurance. The force play here, Benito Santiago, forced at third, but Jack Clark scores on the play. 9-7 Padres, they added two more runs in the bottom of the ninth. Mark Davis with the strikeout. The Padres go on for an 11-7 victory. Jack Clark had his 25th homer. Eric Davis hit his 33rd. The Braves and the Padres. Uh, the Astros uh, hopes even slimmer than the Padres. They need a total collapse with the Giants, really. Houston six back as they visited the Braves in a twilight game. Checking out the highlights in that one. Uh, not exactly a packed house in Atlanta, Fulton County Stadium. Watch the defensive play here. Bill Doran drives at the left center. Ron Gant, the tremendous diving catch in the bottom of the fourth. Yes, as Gant rests and Art Howe looks on, the Braves would uh, pick up the offense. Lonnie Smith turns on this one. Forget about it. A two-run homer, his 21st. Braves lead it 2-0, or Smith also had an RBI single. Two for four in the night. Meanwhile, Tommy Green cruising. Greg Anthony goes down swinging. Green, seven strikeouts. The Braves in a shutout win, 3 0. Green's first career shutout had seven strikeouts. Dodgers and the uh, Giants will play later on, 10 35. Ramon Martinez and Kelly Downs pitching in that one. In the American League, the A's trying to protect their slim lead, a 2 0 lead over Minnesota in the fifth inning. Ricky Henderson had an RBI single. Mark McGuire, a solo homer, his 29th. California leading Cleveland 1-0 in the seventh inning now. Johnny Ray had a sacrifice fly to score that run. Kirk McCaskill and John Farrell are pitching. Seattle and Texas. It's now 3-2. The Mariners are coming back. It was 3-1 in that one. To Chad Kruder had a solo home run for Texas. Pete Incavilla an RBI double. Randy Johnson and Jamie Meyer Moyer are pitching, rather. The Yankees and Milwaukee, a wild one, a brawl in the first game of a doubleheader. The Brewers go on for a 14-1 victory in the first game. Robin Yount, 3-for-5. Joey Meyer, 2-for-4 with 4 RBI. And in the second game, the Yankees leading 3-1 in the seventh inning. Robin Yount has an RBI single. Roberto Kelly for New York has a 2-1, uh, has a two-run single. We'll continue at halftime in just a minute. We'll examine the growing legend of Irk Russell, his Georgia Southern team leading 16-0 at halftime. Welcome back to halftime. There are no blues in Statesboro, Georgia these days, at least during football season. Georgia Southern has become a 1AA juggernaut during the 80s, thanks to a bald 225-pound miracle worker of a head coach. Mitch Glicken profiles Big Irk Russell. We have 26 victories in the last two years. Nobody in America has done that. It's hard to believe that eight years ago, Georgia Southern didn't even have a football program, yet alone a football stadium. In eight short years, Irk Russell has built a dynasty on the Division I AA level. They've won the national title twice and been to the big game three out of the last four seasons. It's truly the stuff legends are made of. It's hard to believe that uh, going into the ninth season and looking back over the years that uh, things have happened the way they have. When we went Division I AA in 1984, I really thought that was professional suicide. Instead of ending his head coaching career prematurely, Irk and his Eagles nearly made it to the playoffs in that first year on the 1AA level. 8-3 and three in our first year in Division 1AA was really a shock to me. And then I was even more shocked when we were able to win the national championship in 85. And then you move on to 86, and everybody, everybody else figured, well, they won it last year, and... Uh, we can expect him to do it again. 
but I was still surprised that we did it in 86. The odds against the team doing that are tremendous, and we were very fortunate. Irk's been more than fortunate when it comes to life off the football field. This down-home good old boy loves living the simple life in the small South Georgia town of Statesboro. <laughs> These are my kind of people, and hopefully I'm their kind of people, too. The 63-year-old head coach definitely is. When the University of Georgia came looking for a head coach to replace the legendary Vince Dooley last year, the people came together and rallied to keep Russell at Southern and breathed a major sigh of relief when Irk decided to stay. Maybe a few years ago, um, I would have thought longer and harder about it. But at that point, when the opportunity came, I didn't feel like making a four- or five-year commitment uh, to anybody or anything, um, not even my wife. The coach is so popular, he's even got his own song. Every day at back the time, you could see him arrive. He stood six feet tall, weighed 225. He was bald at the top and narrow at the hip. And everybody knew you didn't give no lift to Big Earth. That's embarrassing. <laughs> it is? Yeah, it is. It really is. Why is that? Um, well, it's just embarrassing. I'm a below average looking individual, for one thing. And I think, uh, you know, I'm fat, bald headed. And people naturally relate to folks like that. I always stop and think, what's the big deal? After all, what's the big deal? Two national championships, three out of four years you're there. Mitch, I just happened to be here. If I hadn't been here, somebody else would have done the same thing. All right, here we Earth go. Earth Russell's go. worked miracles at Georgia Southern, creating a program that's gone from winning games to winning seasons to winning national championships something the Eagles would like to do. Just one more time for Big Earth. Thanks to Bubba Hawkins and the M&Ms for that nice song there. We're going to continue on our uh, halftime report. Georgia Southern leading Middle Tennessee State at halftime by a score of 16-0. Stay with us. No games this weekend with the implications of Notre Dame and Michigan, but there is a game with Rose Bowl implications. Arizona State and Washington, UCLA, Michigan, Pitt, Syracuse, some other good games. The best way to get your Saturday started, a late breakfast with Bob Carpenter, Bino Cook, and Lee Corso. College football Saturday starts with College Game Day at 11.30 Eastern. We'll preview the top tilts of the day, starting with the battle for Beast of the East, Syracuse traveling to Pittsburgh. We'll deliver the story of college football's most explosive family, the Ismails, Rocket Ragib, Brothers Missile and Bomb, and Mama Launchpad. Basically, I'm just taking everything in stride and just enjoying it while it's happening. But, uh, you know, things like this, they're here one day and going the next, so I'm enjoying it while it's here. Rocket's made a nickname for himself as the most exciting special teams player in the nation. And this year, many of college football's impact players have come from the special teams. Just ask the Ruski ringleader. Our special team has really been, that, that, that's, probably is, that's probably caused our losses as much as any one factor, our inability to execute the special team. That has always been a trademark for us. Those stories are more on game day. Following game day, Rutgers and Northwestern at 1230 Eastern, our primetime game, Pitt and Syracuse from Pittsburgh starting at 7 o'clock Eastern. Back with more at halftime in just a minute. Georgia Southern with a 16-0 lead. Georgia Southern has handled the weather better. Just one turnover, four for Middle Tennessee State. Georgia Southern's kick three field goals. For the second half, we go back now to Statesboro, Barry Tompkins and Gene Washington. All right, thank you, Chris. And Georgia Southern will kick it off to Middle Tennessee to start the second half, leading 16 to nothing in a game that isn't as close as the score, to tell you the truth. Barry, Middle Tennessee, they, they need a score. You know, they need a field goal. They just, they need a score. Then they can think about trying to make a ball game. Out. But they can't just, you know, air it out and go for six right away. They just need to try to do something, go downfield, and just get three points on the board. And yet, it falls into the category of stranger things have happened. Yeah, but, but they need a score. You know what I mean? They just get on the board. Just find a way to get on the board and then go from there. Good Don't just try to get it all back at once. Good Stanley guy has been around the track more times than once. And a kickoff, high kick, headed for Crenshaw at the three. Crenshaw to the ten. A little 
gap to the 20. Out of bounds at about the 23. How did Middle Tennessee do in the first half? The answer is not very well, thank you very much. Middle Tennessee just didn't get it done. As you can see, look at this. Nothing the first time they coughed it up. 12 yards, not much of a drive there. Then they went backwards and had an interception. A one-yard drive, hardly call it a drive. They had a punt after 21 yards. Nothing, three, two, that's the story of the half. And when you look at the numbers, 18 total yards in the first half for Middle Tennessee. They've had better. Here's the pitch to Campbell, and Campbell is turned inside by Kevin Whitley. Good tackle by Kevin Whitley. He was standing there just waiting for him. When that ball was pitched out, he was there in what we call the fundamental football position. Watch this. Tail down, head up. Good tackle. It's really obvious watching Georgia Southern. They are a very well-coached team. Both teams are well-coached. That's to take nothing away from Middle Tennessee. They've been a perennial powerhouse, actually, in 1AA. They've been in the playoffs many times. And again, we point out they are 3-3 three and three against Dirk Russell and the Eagles. This time, not even a chance for the double option. They put it in the belly of the fullback, and when Ironside turned around, he had Giff Smith right in his face. But again, Barry, I have to go back to the point that, you know, they're running the, the option against a team that sees the best option in practice all week long. And uh, to me, you're sort of playing right into their hands with this. They're a team that, by their own definition, is a tailback-oriented team. The fullback blocks, the tailback carries the ball. Well, the tailback hasn't been able to do that very much, and they're forced into alternatives, although that may not be their best alternative. There it is again, and the pitch to Campbell. Campbell just simply cannot get outside. It's just that simple. Hendricks and Hughes on the stop. Not only is Georgia Southern getting their linebackers coming up, but they have the defensive corners. They're in what we call a roll-up zone. They're coming up, forcing. There's just no place for Middle Tennessee to run with the football. This man, really one of the bright, bright defensive coaches in, in, in all of college football. With 17 years, I believe it was, at, at Georgia's a defensive coordinator, he obviously knows something about how to coach a defense. They're a very effective team. Their execution is very good on both sides of the ball. Remember, this is being played in just awful conditions. Daniel the kick. Uh -oh. Terrible kick. That one is about a 15-yarder and then gets maybe another 10 out of the bounce. See how close I am. It's out of bounds about the 42-yard line. Not bad, 20 yards. Into the teeth of the wind. Incidentally, the rain for a moment had let up, but now it is raining hard again and it continues to blow from left to right as you watch it. And believe me, those pictures that you're seeing make it look like it's a much better night than it really is. There's a little bit more of what it really is like. Boots Donnelly, I'll tell you about how he got the nickname in a minute. Here's Ross, the fullback, and they shut it down pretty good on first down. But again, Georgia Southern with great field position to start things. Middle Tennessee, I've noticed, Barry, what they're doing now is they're starting to bring the linebackers in there. They're starting to plug some of those gaps. They're the halftime stats. Look at it. Look at the rushing yardage right in the middle of your screen. That tells the story. 198 on the side of Georgia Southern and one yard for Middle Tennessee. Pretty start. Penalty on that last play. It's been a relatively penalty-free game, actually. <laughs> Face mask was the call. And it'll be a second down and two now for Georgia Southern. So even when there was nothing, they get something. This time Gross on the keeper, and he is surrounded. Good job of defense. Good job on defense. They're slanting those linebackers are starting to shoot in the gaps. They're filling all the holes in there. And, and, you know, and I talked about it in the first half, you know, make them do something other than just running the football. Even if you have to overcommit to the run, do it. You know, make them fake it in there and come back and throw the football. Mike Kelly and Kelvin Robinson. Didn't expect to see much of Kelly. He wasn't even on their roster. And this time it is gross on the keeper again, and they turn it inside. So a very good defensive effort this time. For the Raiders, remember the last sequence they had before halftime was pretty good also. Now on the other hand, Gross, I would think, the quarterback now is going to start thinking, okay, watch the pursuit of the defense. They're, they're, the guys are keeping their feet. They're playing it inside out, playing it inside out playing it very well. Now, if I'm Georgia Southern, I'm going to say, okay, they're overplaying the run. Now it's when I'll come in there and fake that ball. I want to fake that ball into the fullback and then drop back and 
throw the ball downfield. But even with it all, remember the face mask penalty gave him an additional five. Only had two yards to go on that play, and they did get enough for the first down. But Middle Tennessee is playing much better at the line of scrimmage. Give it this time to the fullback, Ross, and Ross slips and falls, trying to make a cut to the outside at the 25-yard line. How did Georgia Southern do in the first half? Considerably better than Middle Tennessee, thank you very much. They started out in fine fashion. 30 yards, wound up in a field goal, that the result of a fumble. And then they went 20 yards and had to give it up. Almost every time, though, as you can see, they're getting at least one first down. Moving the ball, keeping their defense off the field. But then toward the end of the first half, with the exception of that one possession that resulted in a field goal, Middle Tennessee did manage to up a defense it. There's a fumble, Middle Tennessee has it. So there's the break they've been waiting for. And now let's see if they can turn it around offensively. Fairbanks made the hit and Marty Carter, the recovery. Finally paid off, Barry. They, they did a good job. We're talking about how they have changed the tempo. You can see the slants, they're going right, going right. Everybody coming down. Let's see where the ball pops loose here. Oh, good joke. Nice tackle. He really gave Gross a shot there. Marty, Mike Fairbanks, the man who made the hit, Carter the recovery. So now let's see what Middle Tennessee can do with their own 20-yard line. Out of the eye. Give it to the fullback. Forget it. Loss at two. On the nose, Charlie Waller. Help from Steve Busoletti. Barry, I, I think that what they have to do is, but see, that, that wind is facing them. Look at them right in the face. I mean, their strength is throwing the football. They want to throw the football, but they're going right into that wind, so it really handicaps them. It's tough for them to run against this defense. Go for the eye once again and flop the tight end. Give us the camel at the right side. Gets to about the 20-yard line. That was Martin again, not Campbell. I beg your pardon, Ricky Martin in the ball game for Joe Campbell. Hendricks and Maxwell make the stop. Now, Barry, I, I think that uh, what Middle Tennessee, they, they're going to have to you know, go deep into their bag, get some reverses. They got to do something to try to try to generate some positive yardage. They would like to throw the football, but they're facing the wind. Maybe some misdirection if they have a reverse in their plan. You know, now's the time to pull those things out. Third down and ten. Short drop, slant pattern. And even if it's caught, it's going to be well short of the first down. Donaldson did make the catch, but it is well short of the first down. And Dandy will have to come on to punt it away once more. First time they've gone to that two-step drop. See, but the middle, middle Tennessee defense is on the field way too long. So they, they, they got the break, they turned it over, now they go to the sidelines, now they're going to come right back on the field. You know, the defense just can't be out there that long. Three and out. That has been the story of the evening offensively for Middle Tennessee. Daniel to kick. Oglesby will stand at the 45, and again, the Eagles will have good field position. Pretty good kick this time as Daniel managed to drive it, but he didn't get much of a hop that time. Down to the 35-yard line, and that's where Georgia Southern will start, leading 16 to nothing. ESPN's College Football Thursday, Middle Tennessee versus Georgia Southern is brought to you by Ford and your Ford dealer. Have you driven a Ford lately? And by Budweiser, Beachwood Age for that clean, crisp taste. This Bud's for you. 16 to nothing ball game. Georgia Southern leading Middle Tennessee State. It has been all Georgia Southern. That's just about as simply as you can put it. We're just underway in the third period, about nine minutes, seven seconds remaining in this third quarter. The rain has been here from the very beginning. As a matter of fact, it's been here from about noon this afternoon. It slowed just a couple of moments ago, but it has picked up again. Heavy rain, blowing wind, and all Georgia Southern is doing is executing just about perfectly. That was Ross, the ball carrier, now 105 yards. That is his 11th 100 plus yards per game day. But Barry, on that play, we talked about at the beginning of the game, we talked about winning on first down. Middle Tennessee is doing a much better job. That was first down. They held them to less than four yards. So you have to say that Middle Tennessee won on that play. So and now you're looking at a passing down. Made some adjustments at halftime, doing a pretty good job. Gross stopped in the backfield. Loss of two, Richard Kinley, and they are getting it done. Now, of course, it's for the defense to light a fire under the offense for yes. Middle Tennessee. The defense is doing its job. See, now Gross is looking at a situation now, an obvious passing down. See, those guys are going to slant. They slant. Look at those linebackers. They're going in there, filling the gap. 
playing it inside out. Play it inside out. Nice play defensively that time. See, now they'll let him throw anything short. Throw anything short and you surround that. Surround anything short. Straight back and the pass intended that time for Donnie Allen is incomplete. And so once more, the Eagles will have to give it up. That's a good series. A good series on the part of uh, Middle Tennessee on defensively. They did a good job there. Well, now you got to go back to the point that you made just a few moments ago. They got to get some points on the board, and this game changes. Yeah, you know, and you know, they don't have to get it in a hurry because psychologically they can take their time. Ooh. Oh, almost got it. Ooh. But he turned this one over pretty good. Oh, Crenshaw fumbled it, boy. and the Eagles have it. So they have done an excellent job defensively, and they just cannot catch a break. Kenny Madison's the man who recovered it. You can tell he's having, having trouble with that one right from the beginning. It's hard to tell how much the wind had to, you know, do with that, but uh, it looked like he had it, and then he just sort of lost it, sort of like a, a, a baseball in Candlestick Park. And <laughs> Where's it going to go? Where's it going to go? Look at that. Four fumbles lost tonight. Georgia Southern's lost a pair, and Boots Donnelly all by his lonesome. I'm sure he feels even, even lonelier than he looks. Gross will put it up. Looks downfield for the end zone. Almost intercepted. Fine defensive play that time by Jimmy McCamey. McCamey did a good job on that play. He timed it perfectly. Gross is zeroing in. He's not looking at the cornerback. He's just zeroing in on his receiver. McCamey comes up. Look, just timed it perfectly. Could have had a pick there. Yeah, yeah. I think he was more concerned with just knocking it down as opposed to trying to come up with interception. Good job of coverage. Two of eight passing for Raymond Gross. Less than scintillating numbers. And this time Gross on the keeper, and they have that well defensed. They are doing a very good job on that. Randy Horn on the tackle. So Barry, what they're doing, they're playing it inside out. See, you, you play it inside out. You take that first man, you take him, you shut him down. The quarterback, then he comes out, play him inside out. Don't take the pitch man and let him cut under you. String it out. Make him go to the sideline. Good like job of defense. Randy Horn, just a sophomore, hunting to Tennessee. See, they're forcing, they're going to force Georgia Southern to put the ball up. And if they don't put it up, fine. Then you take it over. I think you said that, didn't you? <laughs> and they are going to put it up. Rolling right. And throwing underneath. Fine comeback catch that time by Terrence Sorrell at the 15-yard line. Gate at 12. And a first down. Terrell making up for that drop he had earlier. And he's a big time receiver. He can do it. Last couple of weeks he's come up with a couple of big plays. 62 yard touchdown. Had a 42 yard play that set up a touchdown. Good throw here by Gross. Right on the money. That's a well executed pass play. He had the kind of numbers in high school that I know you got to love. He only caught 12 balls, but listen to this. He caught 12 balls for 445 uh -huh. yards. That's not bad. First out of the 15. And to give us to Ross. And Ross with a little opening inside the five yard line. Ross on the carry inside the five yard line. Fairbanks and Carter Back saved the touchdown. Yeah, Barry, that's a sign of a good team, Georgia Southern. You know, they stopped the run. They came back with a pass play. They did what they had to do. Then they come back to what they do best, run the football. They get you when you're a little down, then they push you down further. Dancing with what brung you. Yeah. See, that's a sign of a well-coached football team. A look at Joe Ross. Routine day for him. 22 carries, 116 yards. we still got a quarter and a half to go. Give it this time to Thompson. Thompson, a short yarding specialist, gets it to about the one yard line. He's already scored once today. Scored the only touchdown of the day. The touchdown man, Ernest Thompson, right? Had what, four touchdowns I think he had in that one game against uh, West, of West Georgia, I guess it was. When they get down there, he smells pay dirt, put it in his hands. Good jumper, too. They run out of the power eye. Let's see if he doesn't just hurdle it this time. Ball at the two yard line. There he is. Touchdown. <laughs> Ernest Thompson has scored in 11 of the last 13 games. 
Now we'll make it 12. Former quarterback, by the way, Barrett. That's near and dear Former to you. Quarterback. And it, yeah, that's right. See those numbers. See, I used to wear 18. I, I, any any guy who wears a number in those teens, boy, you gotta love it. <laughs> get those wide receivers with those T numbers, and then they change the rules. How you can do that? Right. Those are the guys that don't get their shirts dirty, right? 59 remaining, and a look at the scoreboard. Shows Georgia Southern 23, Middle Tennessee nothing. Barry Tompkins with Gene Washington on a rainy night in Georgia. Rainy, windy, stormy, watching for Hugo. <laughs> and all the while, we're watching Georgia Southern execute pretty darn well, considering the conditions here. They lead Middle Tennessee 23 to nothing. And with the wind at his back, Crenshaw, I don't think he'll try it. Shows you what I know. At the 5 to the 10. And it's just across the 15-yard line. But if he'd taken your advice, he would have gained another five yards by just bringing it out to the 20. Here's a look at the way Georgia Southern did it. Ten plays, 64 yards, took three minutes and eight seconds. Thompson, his number's on a day. Listen to this, seven carries, five yards, two touchdowns. <laughs> Touchdown man. And there he is right there. Last season, as you can see, 19 touchdowns, scored 116 points. Those are both school records. He's got nine touchdowns already this year. Iron side will throw, almost has to now against the win. Comebacker is caught nicely that time by Van Dingler. And Oglesby makes the stop, gain a 10 and a first down. And the time to throw is on first down. Because the defense, they're not sure whether he's going to run or throw. He'll get a little more time here, throwing on first down. He has a strong arm, and if he's given time, he can put the football there. You know, like I said, in slow motion, it looks like a dying duck, but that's a well-thrown ball in, under these circumstances. He does have prototypical quarterback size. A little bit slow in his release, still learning to look people off. But remember, this is only the fourth game that he's lined up as the starter. It was a transfer from the University of Tennessee. Straight back again. Goes deep this time for the tight end, and James fell down. Not sure that he was going to catch up with that football under any circumstances. His problem there, his tight end, Melvin James, was open, but he throws the ball too late. Now, if he delivers the ball right now, he's got to get that ball in there right now. See, it's too late now. Too late. They closed on it. See, that's, that's an anticipate where you have to anticipate where he's going to be. You can't wait till he gets there and throw the ball. So, again, the experience factor jumps up. Third down, a yard. Oh, blitz, big blitz. First time they've come. And I don't think they made it. I was a little premature in saying they did not. And they say fumble, I believe, is what they're saying, are they not? Did he caught that football up? Apparently he did, and the Eagles have it. And there is a look at the head man. I did not see a fumble in there. I tell you what, they, they brought a lot of heat up the middle. They brought the linebackers. You'll probably see somebody jump right in there. Well, he dropped the snap. See, there's number 43 coming right in there. Quarterback dropped the ball. Ironside put it on the ground, but he couldn't get to it because he had someone right on his back. Hendricks again, the middle linebacker. He's just Boy, been he's all, all over the, the place. place. So Georgia Southern has it back, and the Eagles back in business at the 25. Ross in the open, 15 to the 10. Tries to break Bumble. a tackle down to the seven yard line. Gain of 18 for Joe Ross. Remember last year he had 157 yards. Look at this. And look at the men up front. Look at those guys up front. Ganey, Twiggs, Bernard. They open the holes and Ross does the rest. I gotta mention Twiggs. Twiggs is the center and weighs 219 pounds. Now, you don't find centers that weigh 219 pounds. I'll tell you what Eric Russell had to say about him. Down to about the four-yard line. Four line. That was Standard Thompson. Number On Twiggs, he said, yeah, he's 219 pounds, but he's a solid, quick, nasty 219 know, pounds. <laughs> and he has. I mean, you would think that you could just push him back into the backfield. Well, that doesn't happen. Power eye, Thompson the up back. Oh, ball at the three. Ganey moves. One of the few execution mistakes that Georgia yeah. Southern has made today. 
Number 51, Ganey, there he goes. You know, the quarterback changed the play, and you know, as you mentioned, they're so often, they're so accustomed to going on that first sound, and that's what happened. He got a little lapse there, went on the first sound, but it was really a signal to Audible. Look at that rain bouncing off Earth's head. Look at it. You know, the, I don't want to say, I don't want to say it's raining hard, but he had hair when we came in here. <laughs> I mean, that's football. It is raining here, folks. It is raining harder. And the give is to Ross, and Ross gets it to the five. Joe Ross on the carry to the five. Kinley on the stop. Still three minutes, 50 seconds remaining in the third period. But still, Barry, the amazing thing, look at that field. Not a puddle to be seen. The best field I have ever seen when it comes to drainage. It really is. Not one puddle out there. It's been raining all day long. <laughs> Here's Ross on a quarter on a quarterback draw. Gross, I beg your pardon, on a quarterback draw, and it was sniffed out very well defensively by Lem Collins, number 95, coming over from a defensive end spot. Nice percentage play. You get down here, you don't want to turn it over. You have a quarterback who can run like Gross. But didn't work this time, but what the heck? Give it a shot. Collins filled the hole nicely that time. So field goal try, 25-yarder. Dallas has it up, and good. A flag is down. And let's check the flag. I doubt they'll take the points off the board, even if it is against Middle Tennessee. And the Blue Raiders started off the field. Now we'll check it out. I believe it is against Middle Tennessee, and so this is not going to matter. I believe they will stay with the points, put them up there, make it 26 to nothing, and kick it off. But the debate still rages. Well. And there you saw the call offside. It'll be refused. The field goal is good, and a look at the scoreboard. Shows Georgia Southern 26, Middle Tennessee nothing. There have been a lot of high points for us at ESPN covering 1AA football over the years, but none more so than this. Tracy Ham capping a 22 point comeback at the 1985 championship game with this touchdown pass to Frank Johnson. Tracy Ham is considered the best player ever to don a uniform at Georgia Southern. To that end, he's the only player to ever have his jersey retired. He's still doing it up in the CFL as a member of the Edmonton Eskimos, running it, throwing it, and winning. Well, when Tracy Ham was here playing for that man, Eric Russell, they call the offense the ham bone, oddly enough. And he really ran it well. And we were talking to Boots Donnelly, the Middle Tennessee coach, about Tracy Ham the other night. He played him, of course, for four years, and he said, the guy was so good, he was illegal. <laughs> In fact, the whole team, Ham just sort of set the tone for everything that Eric Russell has done here. And the hallmark of this team is quickness. And there again, we were talking to Boots Donnelly, who's a very funny guy, and Boots said, you got to be quick when you play there because you got to be able to outrun the Nats or they'll eat you. <laughs> Well, a new quarterback now for Middle Tennessee, Jeff Taylor, just a sophomore out of Dublin, Ohio, and the word on Taylor is that he is a better runner than he is a passer. And as a matter of fact, the word that we got was when Jeff Taylor comes in, they really do drop off a great deal. And Ironside is really clearly the better quarterback, but he's going to be getting some experience right here, and he's got a ways to go. The pitch back to Martin. Martin at the right side doesn't get much. Daryl Hendricks again. Have we been calling that name a lot tonight? He's all over the field. Middle linebacking position, he's reading. He sits there, he reads, and basically what he's doing is he's following the quarterback. And as I mentioned before, as we take a look at Phil Ironside on the sideline, Middle Tennessee needs to get some kind of misdirection. They, they have to pitch the ball that way and come back with a, with a reverse. They gotta do something to get to change this, this momentum, the, the pursuit of Georgia Southern. Here's a give again to Martin, deep handoff, but again, converging on it beautifully. Harris with help from Parr. Talked about Daryl Hendricks a moment ago that we've been calling his name a lot. He has made 10 tackles tonight, but he has affected just about every play he's been in. We see it the way he sees it. Shifts a little to the left, gets out of position, but he comes back over and gets in on the action. Well, again, when we talked to the coaching staff of Middle Tennessee, everyone that we talked to emphasized the fact they got to be able to block the middle linebacker. And 
They haven't done it, and it shows in the scoreboard. Here's a pitch to the left side this time. Martin, who is very quick, gets it up to about the 25-yard line, but well short of the first down on a third and 11. You see how Kevin Whitley, number four, the defensive back, how he played that? He just he fought off the blocker, fought off the blocker, made him go inside where his help was. Good job by the defensive back, Kevin Whitley. The rain continues to come down even harder than before. And the wind has shifted direction just a little bit. Look at that. Well, you don't think our cameramen are earning their pay tonight, do you? No, let's go, Mark! Again, a chance for Georgia Southern to come up with a very good field position. Locked it. I think they got a, got a hand got on it, I think. And down at the 45-yard line, they did well to do that. Randall Boone was the man who got a hand on it. Very good athlete, Randall Boone. As a matter of fact, the coaching staff at Georgia Southern feels that if anybody falls into the category of NFL prospect on their team, it would be Boone, who at 6'3 and 200 pounds plays safety. But some of the coaches of Georgia Southern seem to feel that his future may be as a wide receiver. Take a look from the end zone. So it's a hand. Oh, he, oh, boy, he came close to knocking that one back into the other end zone. He was there in plenty of time. Gross this time on a keeper, slips by a man, gets it down to about the 42-yard line, maybe the 43, Lamp Collins makes the tackle for the Blue Raiders. Eighteen carries, 109 yards now for that man. Raymond Gross doesn't do it spectacularly, but I tell you, he gets it done. And I don't know how much of a difference it makes, Barry, but the raining is coming down much harder now than it was before. Yes, it is. Maybe we'll just stay here tonight, Jim. What do you think? <laughs> Here's a give to Ross inside the 40 to about the 38. So two players now after three quarters as the third quarter winds to a close. Over 100 yards. That man, Joe Ross, 143 yards coming off a 151-yard effort last year and coming off his best game a week ago against Florida A&M. And the quarterback, Raymond Gross, also over 100 yards. Well, that's the end of the third quarter. You can see the Georgia Southern players holding up their hands, signifying fourth quarter. Fourth quarter is theirs, and 15. it has been all game long. We'll be right back. Well, there's Eric Russell, and you know he doesn't even feel those raindrops. Really interesting guy. Give it to Ross this time, and Ross gets it to about the 36-yard line. It's going to be about a yard short of the first down. Talking to Eric Russell about the program here and how Georgia Southern University has really grown. Matter of fact, it's grown from a college to a university just in the last couple of years. And he was saying that I can't tell you that our football program is responsible for the growth of the school, but it is the only thing here that's new. So he's really doing a job, and look at the things he's done by putting Georgia Southern on the map. Back in 1984, eight wins. It goes up from there, 13 wins in national championships for a couple of years, drops back down to a nine-win season, back to a 12-win season. So fell one game short last year. And don't you know he's going to be in a hunt this year? Well, it's obvious that they are a well-coached football team in all areas of the team, defensively, offensively, and on special teams. Ross did get enough for the first down on that last snap, so the ball short of the 35-yard line at 36. Here's Ross again, and Ross slips inside the 30 to the 28-yard line. Gain of seven. The rushing yardage now, Gene, look at these numbers. 267 yards rushing. And what does that say for Middle Tennessee? Looks like a seven to me. Seven yards. That tells you about the game. Flag was down, illegal motion to call against Georgia, Georgia Southern. And don't you have the idea that if the game were closer, you wouldn't have seen an illegal motion there? And Barry, uh, for our viewers, if, if you hear something out there that sounds like popcorn, folks, that's uh, the raindrops uh, hitting our audio equipment. It's really coming down. Which means, I guess, that uh, that storm is uh, getting closer. Yes. I'm trying to stay one step ahead of it tonight. Here's Ross again up the middle, steps over a man, gets down to the 32-yard line. So we got about seven back. And it really does look like they could run that play yeah. all night. Barry, one of the things that happens in college football is just part of the nature of the beast is that if a team gets down, they sort of psychologically really start to, for lack of a better word, cave in. I mean, you know, scores can really get out of hand in the last quarter. As 
time. Gross on a keep, can't quite make the cut. Something interesting, Barry, here. I, maybe our field has reached the saturation point. That was the first time I saw any water spray. First time the whole game that saw any water spray. Well, it's absorbed a lot. So is Middle Tennessee. Look at these numbers. Ross, 24 carries. He's now up to 147. Thompson, eight rushes, eight yards, but two touches. Middle Tennessee just can't get it done. 33 yards total. That is not going to put points on the board. As you can see, the Raiders have coughed it up six times. Georgia Southern only two. Here's Gross this time. Wanted to pitch it. It was knocked out of his hands. There's an excellent defensive effort that time by Mike Caldwell. Gross wanted to pitch it out. Caldwell saw it coming all the way. Just swatted the ball right out of Gross's hand. That was a great play, a really heads-up play. And just at the time that I was talking about people starting to give up, he comes up with a big play. Watch, number 40, top of your screen. Watch, watch. Make him pitch. It sticks it out there, bats it back, and then pushes the quarterback away. He says, no, no, this is my. This player is still playing. Big that's, that's a great play. effort. That's big a great time. effort. He, incidentally, is a first-year freshman, so he is going to be around for four more years. One of only two first-year freshmen that are playing for Boots Donnelly. Taylor at quarterback to throw for the first time. Through and had it batted away. Getting a hand on that one. Troy Donahue, number 99. Not to be confused with Troy Donahue, the actor, in any way, shape, or form. Troy on Donahue. the right side of your screen, probably looks like Wilt Chamberlain coming in as far as the quarterback is concerned. Gets that big paw up there, knocks it away. And those linemen, they, you know, Barry, they're, they're trained. When, they, when the quarterback releases, they go up, put the hand up. Worked out well for him. There he is, Troy Donahue. They shift out of the eye this time. This has been a passing set for them. Taylor straight back. A lot of time, but credit to coverage here. Rolls away in deep trouble. Down all the way back in the 16. Credit the secondary with that one. Sean Harrelson made the sack, but the secondary gave it to him. Georgia Southern secondary, secondary has done an excellent job all night long in terms of coverage. Whitley on the corner, Oglesby. Dixon at the safety, Boone at safety. Really have done an outstanding job. He had a enough time to throw, but everybody was just so covered that eventually the protection broke down. 17-yard loss. Harrelson giving credit for the sack. Here's a draw play, this time with Martin trying to get outside. He's oh, going to oh. 35, 40. He can run. Midfield, 45, 40. Down at the 35-yard line. Biggest play of the night by far for Middle Tennessee. 50 yards on the run by Ricky Martin. Barry, the, the interesting thing about this play is that anybody who's played football knows you're going to run a draw play here. I mean, it, it's, it, that's a classic play. You run a draw play. The only thing that I can think of is that Georgia Southern relaxed. They relax, they said, oh, we got them, they're gonna run it. But this man doesn't relax. Number 28, Ricky Martin, he picks him up and lays him down, boy, almost had six. Four, three, four speed, he's the fastest member of their team, and he showed it there. But unlike Oglesby, we talked about a little earlier, the cornerback, as I believe the Eagles jumped offside, or were they drawn off, we'll see. Oglesby is a guy who doesn't have great speed in the 40, but has good football speed. Martin is the opposite. He is very fast, but he's track fast. And, and, and there is a difference. We've seen it so many times. Uh, Olympians coming out for football teams and uh, uh, on the football field not running very fast at all. There, there's a big difference. Georgia Southern penalized for jumping offside, as you mentioned initially. It's a free play, basically, here for Middle Tennessee. Seven penalties now for Georgia Southern. And they give it this time to Martin, but... It is not going to happen this time. He might have gotten back to the line of scrimmage. Hendricks again with help from Barry. All over the field, the middle linebacker. And Barry, you know, when a middle linebacker is able to get up to all those places, what that means is that the, the defensive tackles are absorbing the blocks. They're taking the blockers off the linebacker, so he's able to pursue. See, they take those linemen. Those linemen can't get out and get a shot on that middle linebacker because the defensive tackles are doing their job. They play very good team defense. You see a lot of bodies flying around on Georgia Southern. Taylor this time straight back to pass again. Throws downfield, and intercepted. intercepted. Well, Taylor, I'm sure would like to have that one back. Randall Boone was the man who intercepted it. No official sign yet. There it is. And 
Taylor really threw that one pretty much to Boone rather than to Danielson, or Donaldson rather. Tunnel vision. He'd made up his mind when he left the huddle that where he was going to throw the football and he, did, and he just did it. He said, I'm going to throw it there. I don't care what happens. So he'd already decided where he was going to throw the football. So he's looking, looking, doesn't care who's around. And I know because I've been in that situation before as a quarterback. And I, I, I made that same mistake before. Seventh turnover for Middle Tennessee. And that doesn't help. But you have the idea that on this day, Turnovers or no turnovers, Georgia Southern is the better of these two teams. And I repeat on this day, it's not out of the question that Middle Tennessee and Georgia Southern can see each other again come the 1AA playoffs. We'll be back. ESPN's College Football Thursday, Middle Tennessee State versus Georgia Southern is brought to you by Anheuser-Busch. We brew our fine quality beers to be enjoyed responsibly. Remember, know when to say when. By Mitsubishi, big screen televisions. This game would look better on a Mitsubishi big screen. And by Sitco, the sign of quality. Hey, this game would look better on a big screen television to us, too. <laughs> look at this, will you? Right over there, put your finger in that. <laughs> Meanwhile, Georgia Southern with the ball, and they will try to use some of the clock here. At least that's what we're hoping. <laughs> Ten and a half minutes left. Irk Russell, he's not wet. He's not cold. Barry, he, he must feel awfully good about the way his football team has performed here tonight. You know, a national television audience said they have a certain amount of pressure in that. You know, playing at night, they usually play their games during the day uh, under the weather conditions. Just a superb job by uh, the Georgia, Georgia Southern football team. This time they shift into the I formation. And they pitch it. I think we got illegal procedure here before the snap. That'll be no play as Carl Miller carried the ball out of a tailback spot in the I formation. There's another look at Eric Russell. Incidentally, one thing that, is, that really does behoove this man and his team is that the championship game this year will be played right here in Statesboro, Georgia. We get to come back here, and the folks here have just been so nice to all our ESPN crew. Looking forward to coming back here for the championship. I'm uh, very, the, the stadium was a, a fairly new stadium, beautiful facility. Now, when did they put this in, in the stadium? Did anybody know when they put the stadium in? It was four, four years four ago. Four years ago? So now the team has, the team has, Lost or not lost any games here, just one. Lost lose one it? game, lost one game Tennessee here in their fourth and, game. And four years. That's right. That ain't bad. No, no, no. Gross checking off. And again, we mentioned when he checks off, that only means he's changing it from one side to the other. They shift into the eye again. They give it to Miller, the tailback. And Miller gets it back to the 20 yard line. Actually, they had told us when we talked to him, they don't do any shifting, they don't go into an eye formation. Maybe, maybe maybe they they're they're giving their upcoming opponents something to think about. That may be exactly right. This is the time to do that. Put something on that teaching reel that they're going to send out. Terry Harwin, who has not oh. had much duty, they come after this one. Almost got a piece. Might have gotten a piece of it actually. I think the wind got a piece of that one too, Barry. <laughs> and it goes dead at the 38-yard line. <laughs> you know, you, you kick it 30, the wind gets it and sends it back 20. Well, it has been a long night for Middle Tennessee. That's a 15-yard punt. God, kickers have to hate this. Oh. We had a flag down. And well, the Eagles have the football back. It appears as though they're going to get it back. 12 men on the field, I think, is the preliminary call against Middle Tennessee. Going from bad to worse for Boots Donnelly's team. Here's the way it's gone for Middle Tennessee. This is a real woe is me right here. Five fumbles, three penalties. That's not too bad. Two interceptions, a couple of sacks, and they haven't put it up that much. Been that kind of night, and the scoreboard shows it. 26 to nothing. It's the, the seven turnovers. See, that's the key. That, that's the killer. The seven turnovers. I'll tell you how the wind has affected the game. The punting averages, and the punters have kicked against the wind 24 yards when they've kicked with the wind 40 yards. 
Gross on the keeper. He's got all kinds of room. 35, dragged down from behind at the 37. Marty Carter, who has made a lot of tackles, makes the stop. Well, you have to be impressed with the quarterback, Raymond Gross. He, uh, you know, he runs smaller than he is because a lot of the option quarterbacks are small guys, very quick, very shifty. He's got some good size on him, but he's very nifty with the football, especially when he gets out in the open field. He reminds you more of a running back because he has that ability, you know, to make the sharp breaks. More and more teams taking their very best athlete, putting him under center where he can touch the ball three quarters of the time. Joe Ross at the right side for a couple. And you only have to look as far as Notre Dame to see that. Beat Michigan, put the ball in the air two times. Never thought I'd see that day where you get the number one team play the number two team and they win and put the ball in the air two times. But one of those went for a touchdown. Oh, well, when you only put it up two times, that almost always happens. There's the story of this one. Eight minutes remaining. And again, Gross. This time he's got no place to go. Looking for help and won't find any. Goes down back at the 35, and it'll be third down in a bunch. Well, again, the defense of Georgia Southern has done the job. Only two touchdowns so far in three and three quarters games. Well, there's no quit you know, on this team. They, they, they keep fighting. Uh, the problem with the defense is they've been on the field. Oh, boy, Interesting. I always wonder about ratings in general. Georgia Southern two weeks ago was rated number one in Division I AA. They go down to Jacksonville and played Florida A&M last week. They beat them 28 to nothing, and they're rated number three this week. They should have let Florida A&M score. That's right. There's the pitch this time to the tailback. Alonzo McGee, and McGee, or rather that is Ross, who was the trailback that time, and is knocked out of bounds after a gain of about five. But it will bring about the presence of the punting team. down a timeout is called by middle tennessee and i'm not sure if when we come back georgia southern will punt we'll be back well here's a little peek inside the television business that is where our producer and our director and all the brain trust sits back right up to this fine stadium paulson stadium now seats about 18,000, but i'll tell you there are big plans here gene they're thinking of stadiums that range up to 50,000 people they eventually have thoughts about moving up from Division I AA to Division I, and on fourth down, they're gonna go for it here. They go out of the power eye, they give it to Thompson, and Thompson needs three, and he's close. I thought he only carried the ball when they were down by the goal line. Yeah, or when That's they have to have three yards. He is the touchdown. Man. He got enough. That, incidentally, is not designed to rub it in, I don't believe. They are, with their wind, with the wind in their face, they don't want to punt it. Bad things happen. Good things will happen, though, here on ESPN coming up this Saturday, 12.30 Eastern time. It'll be Rutgers and Northwestern. Northwestern just simply has not been able to get on track. Good game here, though, I think. Syracuse and Pittsburgh, the nation's number 10 and number 13 ranked teams. That should be a pretty good ball game. This is Hopkins, the ball carrier. I beg your pardon, Ross, the ball carrier. Ross got about three. Now has 176 yards, his best ever. Outstanding player. They have a lot of outstanding players. Yeah, they you know, do. That's one of the nice things about seeing these teams is that you, you find out that there's some very good football players that are playing for universities that we don't hear a lot about nationally. Also, the thing that really impresses me, and you touched upon this earlier, both these teams are really well coached. And well scouted, each team knew an awful lot about the other. And both you and I have been around major college football for a long time, and I'll tell you, I didn't find any difference in meeting with the coaches here and talking with them before the game than I do at any school or any other place in any division. Well, that pretty pretty well tells the, the story tonight, doesn't it? it does. Total yards on first down. We've talked about how important first down is. Luke Stanley felt they had to shut down Georgia Southern on first and second down. Needless to say, he didn't do that. 
started to tell you earlier how Boots Donnelly got his nickname. His nickname was Butch. His mother and father always called him Butch, and he was a baseball player. And he was playing baseball in a summer pro tournament down in Tennessee. And a writer for the Tennessean, when he was a kid, asked him what his nickname was. Butch said, my nickname's Butch. And the writer wrote Boots. <laughs> and ever since then, he's been Boots, Boots. Donnelly. Mike Kelly on the tackle that time, gained him a couple. Barry, actually, I, you know, I'm a little surprised that uh, Gross is still a quarterback. Um, the backup quarterback, that, uh, Huntley. Huntley, I, I would think that, uh, you know, you, for no other reason than not wanting your, your main man to get injured, that Earth might want to pull him out. So the students here at Georgia Southern, sure to have pneumonia tomorrow. <laughs> this time, Gross can't handle the snap, but he manages to contain it. Loss of about two, and once more, it'll be fourth down. I would think they'll go for it again here, to tell you the truth. I'd get my quarterback out of there, is what I'd do. Ed Russell directing a little traffic here. They are going to go for it again. Boy, that rain is coming down now. How, how are we going to get back to the West Coast? It's going to really be interesting. Oh. Isn't it? <laughs> we'll have some tailwind. I was just going to say, we get this rain and this wind, we may be able to do it in about an hour. <laughs> Here's a pitch this time to Hopkins on fourth down. Nothing doing. Middle Tennessee will take over. Mike Kelly makes the tackle. Well, that young man can certainly be proud of his performance tonight. As can several players, all the, the entire team, but there were some outstanding individual performances. Really were. Joe Ross, of course, has to be mentioned. And on the defensive side of the ball, we already talked about Daryl Hendricks. Thought Mike West from a linebacker spot had a big ball game. And the secondary, even though we didn't mention the secondary's name a great deal, any of, any of the individuals, that's mainly because they didn't get the ball out there very much. But they covered very well. And playing quarterback for Middle Tennessee and airing that one out was Dino Stafford. Stafford actually threw the ball nicely, but unable to hold it. There's Joe Ross. Incidentally, I don't know if you've noticed Joe Ross. We haven't had a picture of him up very much tonight, but if you haven't, he's the winner of the Greg Luganis lookalike contest. <laughs> 32 carries, and 182 and yards. And if we stay out here much longer, he'll be able to dive like Greg again. <laughs> this is, this is gonna... <laughs> Stafford back to pass again. No nonsense, just air it out. This one oh. is almost caught by Donaldson downfield. Kevin Whitley defending. That was a pretty good ball thrown by Stafford. It was Derwin Brewer who was the intended receiver, not Donaldson. There's Joe Ross. That is either you are like right. Greg You are absolutely right. Augusta, Georgia. There he is again. <laughs> there you get a pretty good look behind Joe Ross and his teammates of Allen Paulson Stadium here. It is a very nice 18,000 seat stadium. And incidentally, while we look at a third down and longer, third down and 10, got to make mention of the fact that the crowd here tonight, before the game got out of hand, was 16,000 people. And I want to tell you, that takes some nerve to sit out here in that. But this is, this, they love football here. It's a great football town. 16,449. Boy, I tell you, the town of Statesboro ought to take a bow tonight. Georgia Southern has asked for a timeout. Speaking of taking bows, I think, our, I think our cameraman ought to take a bow too. Tim Two, Jimmy Reese, Vinnie Fugit, Chris Rakoff, Terry Jones, Fig Newton. No, I'm not kidding. 235 left, 26 to nothing. Twenty-six to nothing in the rain in Statesboro. I don't know if this is Hugo, but if it's not, it's a reasonable facsimile. I'll tell you that. <laughs> I think this is you win. That's, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Out of the eye formation now. Dino Stafford at quarterback, fourth down. Nothing to do except this. And it is caught for a first down. Or are they saying it's incomplete? Might have said that ball hit the ground first. 
I believe it's ruled incomplete. And Georgia Southern will take over. Dino Stafford looks like he's got a live arm. Barry, now not everyone here is watching this football game and getting wet. That's right. See, we got we got some people here that are high and dry. Now they know how to watch a football game. Those, I want those seats. Yeah. Here is Raymond Gross. All right, Aunt Margaret. You Grandma got the whole Grandpa family in got it. And the quarterback now, Albert Huntley. He's a sophomore from Atlanta. And to give this time as wholesale substitutions in the ball game now for Georgia Southern. And I'll tell you, it is raining so hard. It is awfully hard to pick up numbers there. There's. Some of the numbers on Albert Huntley. That was Alonzo McGee, the ball carrier that time. Barry, I think that the, the people uh, who helped out with the lighting here really deserve kudos because, you know, as we mentioned before, not permanent lights here. A crew had to come in and set up these lights, and they did one heck of a job, and then certainly under adverse uh, conditions. So all of the technical people really deserve a, a, a real vote of thanks and uh, some appreciation for the fine job they've done tonight. And getting this telecast on. I'll tell you, Dennis Baxter, Judy Sapp, Jay Paul, our audio mavens, as McGee gets the call again, gets it down about the 37 yard line. In the truck, Jeff Gowan, leaving the nest on his own. <laughs> John Wildhack looking over his shoulder. Bruce Dumas, the engineer in charge, he is the guy that. Make sure the gremlins stay out of the truck. And of course, the man that can get you one of anything you need, Ron Simeo. Drew Esikoff, Mishkilo Drew Esikoff, our director. Barry, I, I, I've, I see the first huddle. We talked about how good this football field is. Been raining for hours, and uh, right, right, Right in back of the pool back there, the first sign of water on the field. That really says something, because I mean, raining is being kind. It, we were supposed to get eight to 10 inches of rain tonight. Did, did you say there were, there was there's four feet of sand? Four feet of sand and then four feet of rock below that. But even four feet of sand, four feet of rock is not gonna absorb all the water that we've had. And that's how this person got here. <laughs> <laughs> but look at this field. I, I'm, I'm, real, I'm amazed. I've never seen a football field that handles water the way the way this field really acts. I'll say everything done. about the facility here at Georgia Southern, from the weight room, to the locker rooms, the press box, to the coaching staff and the film room is first class. Give it to McGee this time on second down. McGee gets down about the 16-yard line, showing a pretty good burst there. Not a reminder that Bob Carpenter, Bino Cook, and Lee Corso will be with you starting at 11.30 on Saturday to tell you all about what's going to be happening on college football game day. And then we'll take you to the Midwest. Northwestern and Rutgers will play in that one. Wayne Larrabee will be on hand for that. That starts at 12.30. Then the battle for Eastern Dominant Syracuse and Pittsburgh. Two pretty good teams really having a little bit of trouble getting started, but I think starting to get on track. That'll be the evening game beginning at 7 o'clock. Eastern time. All happens this Saturday. College football game day. Out of the power eye on third down about three. McGee gets the call, has the first down to about the 13-yard line. And time ticking down, and that probably will be the last play of the game. And Georgia Southern will run its record to four up and none down. And for Boots Donnelly, a bus ride back to Murfreesboro. Well, you know, they, they came in here and they came in and they took on a very, very good football team, as you mentioned before, a team that's so well coached. And they certainly have reason to be proud of their performance tonight. 29 in a row for that man at Paulson Stadium. So an outstanding ball game here for them. They win it 26 to nothing for Gene Washington. I'm Barry Tompkins. Now let's take you back to Bristol and Chris Fowler. Chris. 
Okay, a salute to the 16,400 plus fans who sat through that rain to watch most of the game. Georgia Southern winning it 26 to nothing. Salute to our crew for putting up with it as well. Hurricane Hugo bearing down on the Georgia and South Carolina coast. Estimated to hit, we're told now, at 2 a.m. Winds of 135 miles per hour off coast. This hurricane is a four on a scale of five. It's the worst hurricane to threaten the coast of Carolina, South Carolina and Georgia this century, we are told. Again, 2 a.m., so folks in that area, please take cover and uh, seek inland ground if you can. That game, of course, the after effects of the hurricane could affect several games this weekend. Mississippi State and Georgia, Georgia Tech and South Carolina, Maryland and Clemson. Any game in that Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina area could be affected. Could see a lot more of the rainy weather this Saturday. Now, for, uh, don't forget to uh, get week three of the college football season started with Bino Cook, Lee Corso, and Bob Carpenter. Share a late breakfast with them. They'll be right here in this studio. College football Saturday starts with college game day at 11.30 Eastern. They'll preview the top tilts of the day, starting with the battle for Beast of the East, Syracuse traveling to Pittsburgh.